Well, it looks like we made it. Through the perils of time and evolution, by the grace of Mother Nature herself, we find ourselves at a culmination. By day's end, we'll witness the next chapter in snowboarding. Among the best men and women snowboarders, a new kind of champion will emerge. You're looking at one of the most dynamic runs in the world. And the conditions? <laughs> well, they're prime. But our riders will have to call upon a lifetime of experience to best this beast. We started with 24 contenders. Today, only 12 remain. Which riders will master this mountain? Who will outwit the competition and claim the title? Best rider on the planet. This is finals day at Natural Selection, and this is Full Spectrum Snowboarding. Good morning from magical Jackson Hole, Wyoming, as the sun rises on the most anticipated day two of the Yeti natural selection event here from Jackson Hole, Wyoming. As you can see, the mountains are awake. Over four feet of snow falling in the last four days. And while, yes, the world's greatest snowboarders on Earth are here, nature, Jackson Hole itself, this mountain is the star. Good morning, everybody watching around the world. Day one of this event reverberated around the world, and you said, yes, we are here for it. We are here for this progression of snowboarding called natural selection. My name is Salema Masakella, and I am joined to my right by Tom T-Bird Monterosso and Mary Walsh, former editor and senior editors of Snowboarder Magazine. I could not ask for smarter, more knowledgeable uh, snowboard insight on this incredible day. I mentioned at the top four feet of snow that has fallen in the last four days. How is that going to affect our course? It's going to affect it in so many ways. With those features that were built over the course of the last two years, more snowfall, it's going to change landings, it's going to slow things down. The riders are really going to have to adapt today here in the finals. Well, you've been communicating, communicating, as I said, over the last four days about how much you have been loving this event. Please continue to do so. In addition to today's live broadcast, lots of ways for you to explore all that is happening here at Natural Selection. Check out Red Bull USA on Instagram and TikTok, where there is pre-event coverage, post-event highlights, and a ton of behind-the-scenes action. Red Bull USA has the exclusive, exclusive Red Bull content that you need to stay locked in through the event here in magical Jackson Hole. This is so exciting. I mean, we're about to see a fantasy league level of rider head-to-head -head matchups right now. I mean, coming off of day one and the excitement that we saw, today is going to be kind of crazy. Yeah, I mean, the day one highlights, you, the, to see people reposting and reposting over the course of the last few days, being like, what have I witnessed? Is this where snowboarding is going? The answer is yes. How about we take a look back on day one here at Yeti Natural Selection. We are here to make history, the Yeti Natural Selection here at Jackson Hole. This is hands down the greatest roster in competition history. 
it's really going to tell us who the best all-around snowboarder on planet Earth is. Best of three head-to-head -head competition. Giggy Ruff kicking it off in stunning fashion. He's choking on powder. <laughs> it's so Shots fired by Jamie Anderson. Huge oh, wildcat. the landing. Oh, you smoked me. I never thought I'd get to compete again. Yeah, seriously. Rasmus is coming in and saying, hey, Jackson, I'm here. It's like the best run ever. I kind of just forgot what I was doing for a minute. I'm coming for your next run. Travis is fired up. This is the tiebreaker we only could have dreamed of. Nice Well, no better way to come out of those day one visions uh, than to welcome in the visionary himself, the busiest man in snowboarding, wearing a double duty as contest director and competitor. Vision come to life. Travis Rice, good morning, sir. What, what was it like for you to uh, on that day one uh, to watch this thing finally be in real life? Uh, man, I, I think for not only me, but the hundreds of people that have worked on this thing over the years, uh, we were all so thrilled. I mean, everything came into alignment. Conditions were amazing. Everyone rode really well. I, yeah, it was one for the books, man. And, and Travis, seeing how much time you and the crew put into this thing in the summer, how does it feel to get ready to drop in on finals day come winter time and see your dream come to life? I appreciate that. Uh, you know, it was a long summer, uh, a lot of, lot of group effort, teamwork, and... You know, going through and kind of visualizing and, and kind of mentally riding this face all summer. You know, a lot of our crew are riders. They were working on it this summer. And, you know, it was, it was, it was teamwork makes dream work, man. Everyone worked their butts off this summer. And, uh, you know, I think the, the results are were definitely visible on qualifier day. Travis, uh, today you have arguably one of the most anticipated and hotly contended matchups for men's quarterfinals. How are you feeling going into your heat against Mark McMorris? You know, I'm, I'm actually thrilled. This is, a, this is really exciting to go head-to-head -head against Sparky on, you know, conditions like this, on this type of venue. Um, you know, watching, watching how far Mark's progressed in the last, you know, eight, nine years. Um, it's a legitimate, probably one of the toughest draws I think I could I'd be up against. So I'm just excited to try to get down, get my run down, and uh, see what see what he has. I got to go first, so he's got to watch me. He's got to watch me first. We like it. We know you're fired up. Rumor has it that a guy named Travis Rice uh, was taking hot laps uh, for a strong part of the day yesterday through the park. True or false? <laughs> Yeah, man, we got we got this sweet little park, you know, a series of three jumps at about 15 feet each. Uh, it, was, it was great, man. I think everyone was sessioning it. I saw Sparky later 
over lunch, whispered in his ear, let him know that I've never felt better on my board. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> Good luck to you, Travis, hey. and thanks for, for taking hey, I wanna, the time with us. I want to uh, just bring on my friend real quick. You see, we've got some weather, and there is no bad weather. Weather is weather. But, you know, human consciousness has been affecting the weather since the beginning of history. I'm going to bring in my friend, Reverend Austin Sweeten, and we need your help. All right, we got some overcast conditions. It's all right, we all got to deal with the same stuff. But my buddy Sweeten here is going to lead us in a little uh, sun chant that he, he himself put together. So he's going to say it. I'm going to repeat it, especially riders in the tent. I want to hear you. Come on, sun! Come on, sun! Sh shine your big sun down! Shine your big sun down! Hallelujah! <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> All right. We appreciate the help. Amen. Thank you, church on Tuesday. Come on, son. Come back out here uh, like we had you yesterday. Uh, that's the spirit that Travis has had for this event from the very beginning, even uh, when we had uh, the riders checking out the course uh, before the event. Uh, how about we take a little uh, GoPro course inspection after that benediction? Yeah, this thing is a behemoth. It is absolutely remarkable what the riders and the Natural Selection Tour staff have done up on that slope. You know, I was talking to Mikkel Bang the other day, and he was actually saying after all of the snow, he wasn't sure how it would ride. So he went and sniffed out a similar slope, similar aspect, similar angle, and he said, in his opinion, the snow kind of compacted nicely. It, fe it felt stable and it felt really, really fast, but we're not gonna know until that first rider drops. The riders have had, you know, the past couple days to really marinate on what they experienced day one, really get used to, you know, the kind of the flow in their brains and like what they wanna be heading into. I spoke with Hannah Beeman and she was saying that that extra time is really kind of helping her mindset adjust to what she, uh, what she wants to hit today. Thank you so much for that. Over 50 options for these riders it is uh it's just a dream course to say the least uh well it's not just us three down here we have the the voice the consciousness if you will of modern snowboarding stan levier at the top of the course stan uh new snow obviously some gray skies wind what is the tone amongst the riders this morning well Salema, you might be able to hear that wind but i think sage gottenberg pretty uh, perfectly stated it in the tent this morning when he said it's going to be cowboy out there. Austin Sweeten said it's a 10 gallon hat kind of day. Completely up in the air as of now. Stan, we've heard a little bit down here that, you know, the wind coming in has buffed out some of the takeoffs. The landings might be a little uh, loaded with extra snow. What have you heard from the riders about their approach in addition to that 10 gallon hat day? Yeah, it's going to be kind of uh, up in the air. I think Austin Sweeten's really going to break it in and let us know. But yes, we have seen a lot of snow fall over the last three days, but we've also seen some wind. So as far as I can see, looks like some of the takeoffs are going to be pretty firm. Landings, hopefully good. Uh, ski patrol had to go in in the last couple days, mitigate, check avalanche danger. So there's a couple, uh, you know, bomb holes around. It's, it's going to be wild in there. All right, Stan, we'll be checking in with you uh, all morning. Travis Rice saying that that new snow may be going to make those, uh, the, the takeoffs a little bit poppy. And the big question is going to be the landings. How is this snow going to affect the landings? Uh, we will find out when that first rider drops. How we got here, 24 of the best snowboarders uh, did their thing in the men's bracket. And look at the names who are not here. Victor Delarue, Bodie Merrill, Elias Elhart, even Jamie Anderson and Anna Gasser got knocked out on day one. When is the last time that you all, you all have announced a contest in which Jamie Anderson and Anna Gasser got knocked out? Unfortunately, we won't be seeing them ride today, but it's going to be incredible. Those riders who did move on are going to put on the show of a lifetime here in Jackson. Indeed, and now we take a look uh, at that women's bracket, Mary. So we have Hannah Beeman, Zoe sadowski Senate, Alina Height, and Marion Erdy. They made it through, and we're very excited to uh, see them ride today. But again, as Tiebert mentioned, 
it is wild looking at the women that did not make it to this next stage of the competition. So the riders that are here today, we're gonna start off with men's quarters and women's semis. It's gonna be a little bit different than it ran the first day because there is no uh, tiebreaker run for these first few rounds. The riders are going to advance purely based on whoever has the highest score out of two runs. And then in the final round, if those riders do tie with one win apiece, a third run will decide the event champion. That is your tiebreaker. That's arguably where the most drama went down on day one. You look at Pat Moore and Nils Mindnick. You look at Travis Rice and Chris Rassman. How they're going to be judged, we're calling it Dave. He's, yeah. like, he's like our other announcer. <laughs> the judges are based, basing their runs on difficulty, amplitude, variety, and execution. And how I like to describe it is an appraisal. It is a line down the mountain and the manner in which you draw that line. I would hate to be an appraiser today, but fortunately, we do have three of the world's best. When you think about this format, I, you know, the fact that one man might have to take nine runs, one woman might have to take five runs, endurance is also going to play in. It is finals day here on day two, Yeti natural selection. We get into the men's quarterfinals upon our return. Get ready. Welcome back. Friends around the world, here we go. Quarterfinal of the men's here at stop one. Yeti natural selection. Austin Sweeten will be coming in first. But uh, we'll take a look at our heat bar. Austin Sweeten versus Blake Paul. Go. Arguably one of the matchups of the day, followed by Ben Ferguson and Sage Kotzenberg. Those two, two years ago, made the movie Joy, and they relied on each other in the backcountry. Today, they're head-to-head. -head. And then, of course, we have Travis Rice and Mark McMorris, one of the most anticipated matchups of today, a finals-level matchup, as everyone is, I suppose, in the men's quarterfinals. And then bringing up the bottom, Mikkel Bang and Pat Moore. Woo! How to pick, how to pick, especially between these two style masters in Austin Sweeten and Blake Paul. Austin Sweeten, of course, no stranger to dropping in for first. He was chosen to drop first at Natural Selection's test event a year ago. Today, with the world's best watching, the little big man, Austin Sweeten from the Northwest, is setting the pace again. My career into the backcountry has been a bit full circle. Growing up in the Northwest, spending a lot of time at Alpentaw and Mount Baker. I grew up riding a lot of resort, obviously powder when it snowed. And then as I got older, um, I started getting into park shoots and getting invited to super parks. So that kind of kicked off that and I followed that trail for a bit. And it wasn't until 2011 when I was on forum and Pat Moore and Jake Welch brought me onto their backcountry crew and I kind of fell in love with the backcountry and followed that. An old soul this young man is. All right, Austin Sweeten on course. This kid is the personification of power and speed. He's kicking things off. I was talking with Austin the other day, and he said, you know, T-Bird, my mind has been moving so fast throughout my career. He's just a tiny ball of energy. He's recently gotten into meditation, and he said that has slowed him down. It's allowed him to be a little more calculated, a little more collected, and you're seeing it right now. Austin Sweeten... This is the guy you want to kick off this event. And there we go with a big back one. Oh, not finding the landing on that. But hey, he's going first. That is a tough, tough position to be in. And you can tell what's great. He's still having fun there, just kind of buttering it around a little bit. You know, it's great seeing Austin in this situation, watching him grow from being a young blood until now in the backcountry. How much I slow down. Austin Sweeten starting that thing off incredibly huge combinations. Coming up short on that gigantic uh, backside 180. We'll get into that later. 
But many say that Blake Paul is the heir to the throne, uh, a Jackson Hole local here. His natural ability and pop second to none. This is Blake Paul. I don't know the last time I competed in a snowboard contest, but probably bank slalom like 2015 or something like that. So yeah, then a slope style contest, probably not since I was 16 or 17. Maybe just feeling like comfortable could be like a home field advantage, just that I've like ridden the mountain a ton and I've like, you know, ridden that chairlift a lot or whatever. But as far as the course goes, I think it's all like kind of brand new features and whatever, it'll be like kind of fresh for everybody. We've all gotten to take some runs with Blake Paul in the last few days. What's the standout thing about Blake Paul that you that the audience should watch for? At the end of every day, down in the riders lounge, at least three people who are lapping with the whole crew, I've heard them say, Blake is so good. They're just following him around his home resort blown away at how light this kid is on his feet. Yeah, his ability to retransition. Uh, if you watch his Instagram parts, you'll watch him take a, a little side hit off a, a, off a cat track that's maybe two feet high and somehow or another transition 30 feet deep and 20 feet high. Yeah, it's unbelievable. This, this kid is one of the most adaptable snowboarders on earth. And right now he's sitting in a position where he knows Let's Austin go, fell. He knows Austin's fell, but he also saw the way Austin decimated the top half of that course. As Blake Paul drops into the course, I mean, exactly what you guys were saying, there are few riders that can combine the spontaneity and flow that he has on a snowboard. And I think it's very indicative that he grew up on this exact, very diverse terrain that Jackson Hole has when we watch him in this course. And there is a huge crippler. That is what Blake Paul is most known for. I'm getting the feeling after talking to Blake a little bit throughout the week, oh, he goes for the tree tap and then goes, head over heels. I was just about to say that I don't think Blake is really planning runs. I don't think that's his approach. I think he's just going with it. He's going with what feels right. He makes it look good. He did fall up there. Austin's got a fall. Let's see how he finishes up his run. And for you at home that aspire to look good on your snowboard, if you're wondering what beautiful turns look like, which the judges are also paying to, attention to, that's Blake Paul. Rather quiet in the finish gate as, as opposed to the, the normal banter that we saw on day one. Top of the course, Austin Sweeten. I mean, Sweeten was flowing. He was absolutely lacing it. Front side 180, little nose butter there. And, and from what I see right now, the snow in the landings does look good. Unfortunately, he kind of overshot that backside 180 and went to the flats. Something Sweeten's known for at times, but this kid does not hold back. It's always going to be challenging dropping first. You know, these guys are really showing everyone how the conditions are and kind of showing the speed, seeing what the landings are set up like. I mean, that was that was a solid, solid run at the top that he can really build on. It's going to be super interesting to see this score come in because now not only are the riders on display, the judges are on display. They're going to have to set the bar for what these scores look like. I mean, the top of the course for both Blake and Sweeten were very similar. Big tricks, upside down, couple butters, couple spins. Look at that massive crippler. I mean, if you think, if you say Blake Paul, that's the trick that comes to mind. Yeah, landing that absolutely in the sweet spot. And, you know, to think about the fact that these riders have had four days off, not used to having a gap. Uh, between runs in a competition. In surf contests, we see it all the time, weather being a factor, etc. as we wait for scores. Yeah. And Blake Paul getting the edge. Pressure now. Wow. 
Yeah, I just need to go ask like for a peasant. Yeah. 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 Pressure on young Austin. Also, the height difference there, impressive. <laughs> ben Ferguson versus Sage Kotzenberg. These two uh, just have been pushing each other in the backcountry the last couple of years. Ben Ferguson, one of the best halfpipe riders in the world, but after the 2018 Olympics, Ben decided powder. I like powder and he wanted to follow some of the legends that he's competing against today. My motivation to be just as well-rounded as I can be is it's just always what I've wanted to do. Like, I'm just chasing what I want to do now. Like, right now, I'm doing backcountry snowboarding. I'm just chasing what dudes like Travis Rice and Pat Moore and Josh Dirksen and all these guys that I've looked up to forever have done, and that's, like, the stuff I think is really cool, and that's what I want to do, so that's what I'm after now. Silence is almost deafening before the drop. Ben Ferguson on course. Riding switch right now. So a new approach for Ben Fur going for that underflip. This is a whole new line for Ferg. I think he is in a great headspace right now. Front side five from Ferg. You know, I was talking with Ben and I said, you and Sage, you guys depended on each other for the making of that film Joy. You were backcountry partners. Now, in essence, you're backcountry enemies today. And he said, I know that Sage is going to want to win, but I'm going to be there to try to stop him. Ben is really a quiet <laughs> storm. Oh, you know, he is laser focused, is, has such good fundamentals on his snowboard. You know, you can never count this guy out. Ah. And word is he just keeps getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And you know he is stoked to drop a full back 720 to put the period on that and put the pressure on Sage. Well, much like Ben Ferguson after winning the 2014 Olympic slope style gold medal, Sage Kostenberg also switched gears. He set his sights on going out of bounds to test his medal in snowboarding's favorite place, the backcountry. Slope style event is man-made. Um, it's definitive. There's a way to ride it. It's designed to be ri ridden a certain way. Whereas the natural selection course here, there's these kind of modified objects. There's tree taps, there's cliffs, there's stuff you can hit a completely different way than someone else. And it's up to your riding and your creativity at the end of the day to showcase that. You know, the, the, can you just imagine the nerves and the focus sitting up at the top, especially after that run. I mean, and you look at a rider like Ben and the look at, look at a rider like Sage. I mean, Ben's been to the Olympics. Sage has won the Olympics. These guys don't really let the pressure get to them, but they're on a totally different stage up there. You know, I think, too, Sage dropping second right now, they're so evenly matched. They know each other so well, but he's got that little edge going into this after getting to watch Ben's run. Let's see what Sage Kotzenberg can do. Can he answer back to the shots fired by Ben Ferguson's full landed run? Cab under flip right there, starting things off. And you see that snow is deep. I mean, four feet in four days here in the Tetons. Heading into Lando's hip. That right there, Wildcat nose grab. A nice little homage to the Wildcat crew up in Whistler, British Columbia. Some backcountry legends up there. They named that trick. But Sage did go down. You know, Sage, when he was competing in slope style back earlier in his career, he was always one of the snowboarding's favorite riders because he doesn't go for stock tricks. He doesn't go for stock grabs. Oh, just pulling through right there and holding on in the landing. That back seven was 
massive. And there you see that technique necessary to adjust and land in powder. You know, a little technical difficulty there in the bottom. We said it before we came on air that uh, the first runs were not going to be the advantage. The, the highest scoring riders opting for that second run, but for Ben Ferguson, that was not a factor. I mean, I, I was saying in his run, I think Ben is in a really, really good headspace. He's been in Jackson for about a month and a half right now, going full savage in the backcountry. He's competitively trained. He's been riding here. He knows the terrain. And check this out. There's that cab underflip right there. Coming into that second feature. Front side five, so landing switch in power. Not the easiest thing. And then going giganto backside seven. And that leads me to believe Ben put one down. His run was incredible. He might be able to take that to 10. He might be feeling that confidence how for about, his second run. How about the size and perspective when you see that shot from the bottom and from the side? This course is, in, is inhumane. Oh, and there we see Sage going down on that hit. You know, that's going to hurt him a little bit, but you know, I think that uh, now he's going up to the second second run with a better idea of how he wants to play it against uh, his friend. And he goes back seven, double grab. And that gives you a pretty unique perspective as to how deep that snow really is up there. I mean, that was amazing hanging onto that landing right there. Wow, a 90.3. And remember, the tie-breaking factor is the highest scored run. It's a little silent goodbye there. Yeah, those are two homies who had nothing to say to each other as we will anticipate their run two. Oh, this has been a tough one. The, the social's going off. Travis Rice versus Mark McMorris. Mark McMorris uh, would love to be the heir apparent of that title of best snowboarder ever. But Travis Rice, I mean, what, can, what can't you say? Uh, this is uh, the brainchild of Travis. This is his invention, you know, 13 years ago. And here we are today at the first stop of Travis's dream. You know, for me, it's, it's pretty full circle to be able to bring this event back to Jackson after trying this for the first time in 2008. And at the end of the day, the amount of support that, you know, we've received from the community that is Jackson Mountain Resort I mean, we couldn't have done this without them. For sure, this has been the heaviest lift as far as size, scale, scope of the project. I think this, this with the amount of people involved in bringing this thing forward, um, yeah, this is the biggest project I've worked on. You see Travis making final adjustments there. You can't say it enough how much Travis has been working behind the scenes as event director, expecting a baby eight weeks from now. Does he have what it takes to put all that aside and com compartmentalize against Mark? I think the best term or best phrase to, to you know, describe this matchup is the great ones rise. Mm. So Travis Rice on course, taking a different line than day one. Coming into that first feature, Genesis won huge backside rodeo. That was quintessential, Travis Rice. That's taken me back to that's it, that's all. Backside 360, kind of cross-courting that one. Now cutting opposite fall line. Travis is drawing a very nice line here. You know, you had to think he's probably been visualizing this line for days. I don't think he had the performance he wanted on day one, and this is his opportunity to really rebate and take advantage of what he has built. Gigantic cab nine from Travis Rice. That was a completely different look than we've seen from Trap. And you saw that Whoa! struggle of that adjusting for that snow on that takeoff. All righty. Oh, 
that's a good time. Wow. If you don't think that Travis is here to win, uh, you, <laughs> you know now. In 2012, Travis uh, invited then 19-year-old Mark McMorris to compete in Rebel Supernatural at Baldface in British Columbia. And safe to say that Mark was a little bit humbled in that appearance. And that event is what really pivoted Mark and made him focus on the backcountry. Yeah, 2012, the very first time I got eyes on Scary Cherry at Baldface in British Columbia, all I could think was, holy shit, this is really steep. I had literally no experience in the backcountry, and um, I was just so thrilled to be around a lot of my heroes, and um, it was a great learning experience, and I wouldn't change it for the world. I had a great time, and I was lucky enough to go back the next year and sort of hold my own and do a whole bunch better. Every night since day one, Mark McMorris has watched the day one event on repeat every night if you're talking about riders who embody snowboard competition you're looking at them right here mark mcmorris on course i've heard rumors and dabblings about what he might have in store mark making purple his signature kit matching all the way down to the oakley goggles that back seven was beautiful i mean the amount of times that mark has dropped second or at the end oh wow and really come through i mean th this guy has the ability to to focus and just put it down under pressure and if you're dropping after travis rice in his home court that is pressure and if you saw those back-to-back -back sevens coupled with that method also take into account it's the intricacies of the run that the judges are also scoring that was a nice line through the trees at the end honestly that looked fun little Yeti recap opening with Travis. Yeah, let's see what goes down here. So backside rodeo, Trav, landing switch. I think they both got an equal number of actual pow turns in there. And Trav goes cab nine, little trouble riding out there, how much that's gonna affect his score. As you see, he just gets caught in a track. And witnessing that control to, to somewhat recover. Anyone else would have ragdolled. Right, he's just so, so strong. And then we have Mark, I mean, coming out of the gate, just really, really strong. This is the matchup that we expect between these two guys. So I've kind of heard dabblings about the back-to-back -back sevens. I've also heard that those might turn into tens if need be. If you know Mark McMorris, you know that he has five gears. That was gear two. Yeah, he can go up three more. You heard him say to Travis that he had to make an adjustment there. That one. In his oh, line. To go either way. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think they're gonna give it to you for the just cleanliness. Cleanliness is godliness. Thank you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> give me something to chase here. Oh, we're both. <laughs> wow. All Come right. on, buddy. Let's go. Mark McMorris with an 88. And Travis Rice, uh, the exit words there was, it's on. He said, give me something to chase. You know, Travis himself, he says this contest is all about adaptation. And so that's what's coming into the second Ooh. run for these guys. <laughs> Ooh. And finally, but not least, Micklebang versus Pat Moore. Two supreme style masters. Mickle with three X Games medals of the bronze variety. This kid has been showing his abilities and talent in the backcountry since he was very young when we met him when he was 12 and he just continues to show that snowboarding in the backcountry is his dream.
You know, I always wanted to be a backcountry rider, even when I started competing, because my favorite riders were filming and being in the backcountry. Uh, but to be able to do that, I had to, you know, get in the scene and compete, and then eventually it led to me uh, having the chance to actually go film in the backcountry. So, yeah, I'd say from the very beginning, I always wanted to be in the backcountry. <laughs> Nickel about six foot three, and you'll notice that he rides the biggest board in the in the field, at 170 centimeters. How is Mikkel Bang going to start things off? Heading toward riders right of the course. I'm going down on that back one. Rough start, but plenty of course to make up for it. That's the beauty of this format and how they're judged. A switch method into POW. What kind of control does that take? Arguably the hardest trick in snowboarding. Front side, seven no's. Going down, Mikkel Bang. I kind of feel like he had nothing to lose at that point. He did go down on that little backside 180. He just opened the door for Pat Moore. All week. Their rivalry, as well as Sweeten and Blake's, oh, has been a little shit. more playful. Oh, no. Oh, oh man. Dang. Mickle knows uh, that he has left the door open yep. uh, for Pat Moore, and he is no doubt uh, disappointed because while Pat does not compete often. When he does, the level of focus is high. Pat Moore known for pushing the limits in his films, which takes meticulous planning and preparation. And when it comes to the backcountry, there is nobody, nobody more prepared or more comfortable. I can't speak for the other riders, but for myself, when I'm out filming in the backcountry, I usually take a lot of time to just prep and figure out exactly what we're gonna ride. So before I even drop in, I have a really good idea of how fast to go, where the landing is, all the, all the variables. Uh, with this course, it's kinda you're, you're riding blind a little bit and you're not quite sure what the speed is for some of the gaps or, or what's even below some of the takeoffs. So, um, so yeah, I think, I think the biggest, um, concern that I have is just kind of going in too hot or too slow and and you know but that's the that's kind of how it works the pride of New Hampshire Pat Moore raised literally on the mountains from the time that he was an infant his mom worked on the mountain been riding since he was three years old like this if he, this if there's anybody who just eats breathes snowboarding it's Pat this is really a full circle moment for him in his career, too. I mean, he and Travis have been riding together since the Grenade movies. I mean, they've been riding in the backcountry. They, you know, they've gone toe-to-toe -to -toe for a long time, and now uh, they're here together in this competition. There's that back seven. We saw that on day one. Will he follow it up with that front seven? Front three, and Pat catches the knuckle. So each rider, both Pat and Mickle, have a fall in their run. Can Pat sneak in one more feature? You, you know, talk. it's an interesting matchup, too, because, you know, Pat and Mickle were both kind of child stars in snowboarding. They've been around for such a long time. They've always been in the snowboarding vernacular. You forget that. They are not that old. They've just been pro snowboarders for 15 plus years. It is. A lot of variables like getting in. Yeah. 
Oops, sorry, dude. Okay. Yeah, I like. <sighs> Took one last speed check. Yeah. And I just or one too many speed checks. <sighs> Go. Respect to the Swiss method. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was that? That was insane. Oh man. Respect to the switch method. Couldn't have said it better myself. Well you did say the hardest trick done here. Starting things off with that cab five. This is Mickle Bang and the front seven kind of landed on his back right there. Very unlike Mickle. He's very sure footed on his feet out there. I mean, this is tough. This is where we see a lot of the weather conditions coming into play. You see two incredibly strong riders both having trouble putting the landing gear down. I mean, it's not it's not easy up there right now. And that right there, Pat came up short. You heard him tell Mikel, took one too many speed checks in yeah. that jump. So, right there. Nice. nice. What was the difference you think for Pat? Two falls for Mickle, one fall for Pat. Very close scores. Woo! Well, we knew that they were going to come out firing, uh, and they have these riders showing why they are the best in the world, adjusting for conditions. And we look forward to our second runs. Day one, it is on, excuse me, day two, it is on here at the Yeti Natural Selection. Stay with us for the second runs. Welcome back, friends. A windy day, some gray skies. Mother Nature is the star, of course, of Natural Selection. And she woke up this morning and said, we're gonna make things interesting and see if the best in the world can rise to the challenge and so far they are as we get ready for run two Salama Masakela here with T-Bird Tom Monteroso and Jeff Moran joining us hello gentlemen good morning sir you are a local here many years as we welcome in uh, Blake Paul about to take his run uh, what did you see uh, in those first runs according to what um, the conditions are today I, I think even regardless of what the conditions are, right, everybody has the same conditions. We saw everybody come out of the gate way hotter than day one. And I think that goes to, to show that everybody knows the course a little bit better. And they also really understand that the stakes are higher. Love it. And now we're going to take out, uh, check out a, a little bit about what the riders are riding in our gear talk session. This one with Blake Paul presented by Backcountry. My name is Blake Paul and I'm from Jackson, Wyoming. I'm riding the GNU Hyper. This is my pro model board with GNU that we've been developing for four or five years now. It's a directional freestyle all mountain board. A little softer with XC2 camber. That's a little bit of reverse camber under middle here and camber under the feet. Just having a touch of reverse camber in there mixed with the camber profile helps you to float and kind of stay up in the powder and get places that you need to go really quickly, but it also has stiffness to be able to land and kind of hit these big freestyle features that are on the course. Uh, we get more full-length gear talks at naturalselectiontour.com. What do you make of uh, the all-in-one camber situation? You know, I have my preferences, but I can't ride like these guys and gals out here. I'm a camber guy myself. Good old-fashioned reverse rocker. All right, Blake Paul in the lead. Pressure on Austin Sweeten. Absolutely, and it's very important to remember there is no tiebreaker in this round. It comes down to the highest score. So depending on what Blake does, the ball's kind of in his court right now. He's sitting on a 67.6. Austin Sweeten's first run score is a flat 60. And this is an interesting matchup, you know, because these are not tried and true competitive snowboarders. So I'm wondering, is it kind of an ignorance is bliss thing? Maybe the pressure gets to them less? I think that 
it looks like they're just having fun. And one thing I've noticed, uh, you know, from day two carrying over to, or from day one carrying over to day two, we keep talking about Austin's power and speed, yep. but that could work against him. He needs to dial that in. Blake is smooth. He's making those transitions. And Austin, these aren't limitless endings, you know, or landings. He's got to hit the landing. We saw that in run one on that huge frontside 360. 360. We saw it today on uh, the backside 180. We'll see if he can hit the shifter, if you, if you will. See if the froth goblin can dial it in, backside three, into a front five, and going down in the landing. So not quite dialing it back, but there's still a lot of course left. Right now, he's got to try to get a 67.6 or higher. It definitely brings it back to more of a, a traditional style competition scenario. So that has changed the strategy for all of the riders going into this. I could watch a method into powder all day long. Sweeten getting lost in that powder cloud. I don't know if that's going to be enough. Blake Paul has the advantage right now. Hands on the wheel with a first run score that's already higher than Sweeten. And Blake seeing this go down, he knows what he's up against for run two. Yeah, could we be in a victory lap situation? He didn't need to say any words there, yep. you know, to feel the disappointment. As happy-go-lucky as Austin is, he, he, wa he came here this morning wanting to advanced and advantage Blake Paul like you said could be a victory lap he's not going to take it easy he's going to utilize this run uh, and show us why he's considered attempt to show us why he's considered uh, one of the best and one of the future of the sport yeah if you've seen the Vans films Landline and Evergreen I mean that was that was really Blake's introduction into this realm and he quickly became one of the most popular backcountry riders alive Jeff, do you, do you think there's something about growing up here uh, in Jackson that gives Blake an advantage? I think growing up and riding here, the whole mountain is a park. And I know that that can be said for a lot of mountains, but this, this mountain is really unique with the amount of gullies and the varied, varied terrain. Like it really makes you learn how to keep up with your crew, but also you got to put tricks down if you want to hang with all your homies. I've learned that just lapping with these riders all week. <laughs> It's tough to keep up. I've gotten left in the dust so many times this week. But you know what? Each day I've gotten faster. <laughs> Thank you, Mother Nature, for the break. All right, Blake Paul on course. Let's see what he's going to do. Let's see what this kid's got. Taking a very similar line to his first run. Such smooth style. Even just, he looks so lazy in between the hits, and that's that's a good thing. It, it looks like he has total control over what he's doing, but makes it look really, really good. I mean, is there a prettier trick than that crippler from that angle? And straight into a gorgeous frontside slash of joy. <laughs> slash of joy, I like that. Going back three, that was huge. That was, I mean, I think that's Pine Island, and the drone... Uh, angle is beautiful, but when you see that from away, it's so big. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say game, set, match, Blake Paul. That was a beautiful run. I mean, he landed pretty much all of those tricks from takeoff to sweet spot. So sick, dude. I mean, I think Sweeten might know it too. I mean, Blake, he's going to be hard to beat today. But here we look at Austin Sweeten, backside 360. And look at how fast this kid rides. And this is where it goes wrong, that front side five. And it, Jeff, it goes back to what you said. It's He kind of needed to dial it back a little bit. Yeah, they have very similar backgrounds, but very different approaches to this course. And take nothing away from this kid. It's just the first of many times you will see him in this venue. Austin Sweeten rode incredible today. But Blake Paul, he in that in that run, those two runs, he was incredible. Crippler to backside three. 
Here's that angle. This gives a real true perspective on how big of a hit that is. That's about 75 feet end to end. And look at how he catches the top of the landing to maintain his speed. He just seems to have it figured out. We hate to see you go, Austin Sweeten. Thanks for the spirit and the energy all week. But the local boy, Blake Paul, putting the rest of the feel on notice and saying, it's a home game for me. Come and get it. Yeah, this is where it's going to start to get quite stressful in the booth and up on the hill. Ben Ferguson, I mean, he, he's someone that you watch in a, in a half pipe contest and you, you just always are so joyful because you're like, this kid is doing it his own way. Never ever choosing to chase the field, rides in full self-expression and then he takes that and transfers it into the backcountry. I was looking at the matchup with Ben and Sage, uh, I would have thought that Ben's half pipe background wouldn't translate as well as Sage's slope style background and that is absolutely not the case. Yeah, Ben went from being in the half pipe, every snowboarder's favorite snowboarder, to translating that into the backcountry. And if I'm Ben Ferguson right now, I know I'm in the lead. I've scored the highest run of the day thus far, but I'm very aware that Sage is dropping right behind me. Switch backy. That was unreal. Ben Ferguson, he's changing things up. It is incredible how much snow is on that course right now. Switch back five from Ben Ferg. Wow, taking some chances, switching up his second run from his first. He knows what Sage has. There's no way he can lay back and, and just rest on being in the lead. Absolutely, he put it all on the line right there. He took some big chances with that run. I mean, you have to when you have such a seasoned veteran competitor like Sage Kotzenberg behind you. It's like, yes, you are the homie. I love being filming with you, but like we said at the top, like, I got to take you out. And Sage, you know, if you when you think about it, Sage really kind of set the tone for some of Ben's choices in his career, like opting out of continuing to be that Olympic-driven athlete and taking it to the back, Ben following, them fueling off each other in, in, in creativity. And it's, it's crazy that, like, they're basically from the same, same district in this Hunger game. <laughs> Absolutely. And it, it's impossible to ignore that that precedent was largely set by one Travis Rice himself. Travis has been in the X Games. He's been in the U.S. Open. And he said, you know what? The mountains are calling. It's the evolution of a full spectrum snowboarding career. Last minute, glove adjustments for Sage. He is about to, he's gonna throw it all out. As Sage would say, it's Rambo time. <laughs> so Sage Kotzenberg on course. He's got to stay on his feet. Coming in switch, going for that cab underflip. Woke up this morning and watched Gladiator <laughs> to get himself <laughs> fired up for this morning. One of the more understated parts of the runs we're seeing is so many more people riding and taking off switch. Just simply riding pow switch, that in itself is a trick. And the judges are going to reward them for that. So backflip nose grab into a front three. Let's see what Sage Kotzenberg has here down at the bottom of the course. Reverting around again to switch and going cab nine nose stomping it. Keep in mind though, Ben Ferg is currently sitting on the highest score of the day thus far. <laughs> Push me. <laughs> I knew 
knew you were going down. <laughs> Dude, I knew you were doing it before you were breathing. <laughs> Heard Ben Ferguson say, I knew you were doing that cab nine before you even reverted. That's how well these riders know each other. There's Ben Ferguson with that huge switch backflip. I mean, taking off in pow, landing in pow, and then going into that switch backside 540. I think Ben is looking the strongest of any rider we've seen today. And I think he's in a great headspace to, to advance in this competition. He knew Sage wasn't going to let him have it easy, and he definitely came out swinging. And Sage going down right there on that hip. And there it is, the cab nine, potentially trick of the day thus far. Will it be enough, though, to take down his good buddy, Ben Ferguson? This head-to-head, -head, it's an interesting format. It really, really is. And that, that 900, I mean, he, he landed that thing and smacked it down. You see that the, the size of it. Again, Ben sitting on that high score. Sage did give him a run in the second. Keep it going. But the Joy Boys are now separate. Ben Ferguson moving on. Here we are, the most hotly anticipated battle, at least online, in Travis Rice, arguably the greatest snowboarder alive and of all time. Mark McMorris, greatest competitor uh, of all time. And T. Rice, you know, the visionary. We talk about it. We can't state it enough. Going back to 2008 with the original natural selection, um, his vision and his drive, not for himself, but for snowboarding. How do I move snowboarding forward has always been his theme. It's eternal optimism fueled by progression. That is how Travis Rice operates. He's a dreamer and he's an executor at the same time. He's also 38 years old and expecting a child in eight weeks and has not slept much as the organizer of this event. But how about if he comes back and puts the pressure on Mark McMorris? Let's watch. Little front side 180 there. Travis dipping into the trees. He is eyeing up Genesis 1. Cab 540 into a frontside 3. That was a quick combo. I Jer like that, and I think the judges will too. Power, speed, and strength. That is Travis Rice. Travis entering the bottom half of the course. Double backflip from Travis Rice. Are you kidding me? Pulling no punches and telling Mark McMorris up top, I'm not going down easy. Not as clean of a landing as he would have liked. A big difficulty on that trip. And he knows it too. He knows it. Yeah, we didn't see the full ending, but that reaction says it all. But I like how he took it to the youngin. How does Mark react now? Well, he is currently sitting on a first run score of 88. Remember, there are no tiebreakers in this first round on day two. So he's thinking to himself, is Travis's run better than an 88? But knowing Mark as, as well as I do, he's pulling no punches too. He's going full bore, really trying to put the nail in the coffin here. This isn't the time to lay back. This is, he's got to put it all out there. He's got a good run to, to lay, lean on, but he can't, he can't rely on it being 100%. He doesn't even know what lay back means. Unless it's a slash. <laughs> I've not seen him in anything other than a purple variation kit. Signature color. Wildcat to open up. Mark taking the riders left side of the course. There's that backside 720. Perfect landing. 
Mark's feeling good as we start coming into the more open part of the course. Into the front side seven, similar to his first run, and pay attention to those turns in between. So there's that cab underflip. And Mark stayed on his feet. If he can continue this run, I think he's going to advance. That was four big tricks. It's over. Oh! Shit. <laughs> oh, hell yeah, buddy. Yes, yeah, Trav. Nice work, Trav. Thank you. Way to keep it clean. Hey. Dude, double backy. It. What? What happened? Oh, dude, whatever. I was anticipating what you were going to do. I knew I had to step it up. Did you go long? Well, I just landed in some tracks, I think. Just. <laughs> That was crazy. Hey, this Eat is it. insane. Yeah, how's our heat, dude? <laughs> oh, man. We'll play it, Spark. Thank you, bud. As we go into the Yeti recap, Travis Rice came up to me at dinner last night, and he said, do you think the kid is going to go double combo on me? Do I, should I be nervous? And I was like, excuse me? He was feeling it. So Travis, cab five, front three, method and that huge double backy and you heard it from the man himself he might have got caught up in some tracks a little too far back seat but on the contrary mark mcmorris looking super consistent super smooth today so the 720 back-to-back -back combo into the underflip Right now, the strongest riders I've seen on this course are Mark McMorris and Ben Ferguson. Oh, my lord. Yes. This guy, huh? How solid is this dude? This guy bringing us here to Jackson. How lucky are we? <laughs> oh. Moving on, baby. Love you, Trav. Yeah, you too, my friend. Thank you for having me here. Thanks for doing all the back end as well as trying to snowboard. And look at that, a torch past. No one's going to forget that Mark McMorris took out the GOAT here at Natural Selection and up that score uh, from the 80s into that 91. Mikkel Bang. The big man. Hand selected a few years back to ride in Travis's film, The Art of Flight. I mean, it's really a full circle game here, right? When Travis is helping to select these riders, he's like, who have I ridden with? Who can perform? Who's got it? And Mikkel does. Agreed. The majority of this field have a history of riding with Travis in one form or another. And that speaks to Trav's greatness as well. And in this heat, it's interesting. You know, it's not, Pat's not sit sitting on a high score. It's a 44.3. So Mikkel, door super open absolutely this is technically a, a one run final here who can put down the best score oh mickle goes down on the back 180 that is very unlike mickle bang and that was just a setup trick for his switch method let's see if he can kind of generate some speed here and give the people what they want we saw a similar thing happen in the opening rounds with chris rasman absolutely there it is. That is a thing of beauty. Even just bringing it back around forward, he made that look good. It was kind of a switch butter. Every part of this course counts. And that front seven where things went wrong for him on run one, he stomps clean. I love the way he just kind of grabbed that and boned it out in the middle as well. Uh-oh, Bernie Sanders eating him up a little bit there at the bottom. So two falls for Mickle on that second run. Oh, man. Really speaks to, to the pressure of this event. Like you said before, a one-run final of Pat can't assume that Mickle, with a couple of those of you know with the switch method etc could have gotten better than a 44. 
because the judging criteria for this event is something we've never seen before, there's no precedent set. So if I'm Pat Moore, even though I'm in the lead, you're going all out for this one run. And I love that the riders don't get to see that score, that second score, until after they take their run. Right. Everybody's in the dark. What I'm interested to see is will Pat try something new? Is he comfortable enough in the lead to try something new? Or is he going to say, you know what, I'm doing the same as run one, but I'm going to put it down clean and advance on to the next round? In which he would face Mark McMorris. I think at this point, it's all about advancing. It's right, it's making it to the next stage. Let's see what Pat Moore is going to do. All eyes from the Granite State on the man himself. Backside 720. That was clean. We've seen it before, but that was one of the best looking ones he's done over the course of these two days. Okay, so front side three, that's where it went wrong on run one. He caught the knuckle of it, landed that one clean. And Pat right now is in a very good position. Pat looking like he is not going to lose the plot. Just Smooth. Do what needs to be done to send Mickle home. I think Pat's feeling good about that one. Respect, man. That one, that was so sick. I wish you got that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. The front seven. Oh, dude, my God. That was so sick. Oh, dude. You did those like no one else. I kind of felt like I missed a grab on that one, but pulled me. What's that? Pulled me. Yeah. <laughs> Such respect <laughs> between this rider field as you heard Pat say, I wish you got that one. And it came down to just a small setup backside 180, trying to set up for that switch method. But this is what Pat and Mikel were talking about, front side seven nose grab. And the way he, he the way Mikkel rides, he's so tall that it really just accentuates every grab and every single tweak. He's smooth, he's fluid, and he's powerful. I was, I was a bit surprised by how clean that landing was, considering how the end of that spin looked. And here we go with Pat, that beautiful back seven. And again, like you said, T-Bird, where, where Pat went down earlier, just getting over the knuckle there and riding away clean on that front three. It goes to Mickle. There wasn't any tiebreaker set. Mickle bang with a high score. 55. It goes to high yeah, score. Dude. Mickle's in shock. And that's what we were talking about. We don't know how this is going to be judged. I think he got a lot for that switch method. Yeah. The switch method was one of the most unique tricks. That and Ferg's switch backflip. Like, we're seeing sevens, we're seeing fives, and people are landing them, but they're not, they're not necessarily unique to each other rider's run. And that's where we have to take ourselves out of any other event yep. that we've ever done before and really think about the, the Dave of Absolutely. the judging system and how these judges are looking at the overall impression of what's thrown down. In many respects, falls don't count like they do in a slope style or half pipe competition. Well, we've definitely seen that. I mean, you know, almost everybody's had one or two little mishaps on their runs, and that's not what takes you out. You said it before, that switch method was possibly the best trick of the event. And here are our brackets. Blake Paul gonna face Ben Ferguson and Mark McMorris against Mikkel Bang, who was a little bit surprised, but happy to be here. Those are your semifinal setup. A final four for the ages. Did you ever think you would see those names 
grouped together on a competition start list. I can't wait. <laughs> we see we say that every round. It's just <laughs> it's like mind boggling, right? Oh well, the women's semifinal is about to begin. We head up uh, to the top. Stan, what's the mood, my dude? Wow, uh, what a day, okay? Energy is high. First runs out of the way. When the tent conversation is, how's the visibility? How's the snow? How big did Austin Sweeten go? Pretty much the, what the vibe has been down here. Ladies are feeling excited. I don't know if you noticed on Instagram, Hannah Beeman's got a rose gold mic in the rider's tent, kind of putting me to shame. Stan, are we going to see that mic used? I need that answer from Hannah before she drops. <laughs> I think that if uh, if I can do pull a couple strings, I'm going to see what I can do. Yeah. Uh, Stan, is uh, any any feedback from the riders about you know a change in their game plan based on some of that flat light we're seeing? Um, for the men, I don't think so. The big conversation has kind of been: Will someone go double? Uh, Mark McMorris, we saw Travis Rice preemptively worried about it, hence why he hucked that double backflip. Um, for the women, I'm not sure there's as much of a conversation about what the trick is that needs to be done. Thank you, Stan. You remain a scholar, and we will be reaching out to you many more times before the day is out. We talked about Hannah Beeman having the microphone, but, but what else does Hannah Beeman have gear-wise? Let's take a look at what Hannah Beeman has under her feet in this little edition of Gear Talk. My name is Hannah Beeman, and I am from Bellingham, Washington. I am riding a ride snowboard setup, which is the Psycho Candy snowboard, which is awesome for deep powder shredding, which is hopefully what we're doing here this week. What I love about this board, besides the awesome graphics, the shape is pretty much tailored to be a powder slayer all over the mountain, but also can shred around in some chop and just kind of cruise around the mountain in general. I think I'm most excited, obviously, to take my runs and actually get to hit some of the features out there. But I'm also super excited to watch this just incredible field of athletes that have come together. I just feel like we have so much talent and there's going to be some amazing moments. So hopefully that makes me want to send it and, and do some cool stuff too. Well, if you want to know what snowboard and how to set up your board, listen to Hannah Beeman because she is doing a couple things right here as she is going to be competing here in the semifinals at Natural Selection here at Jackson Hole. Welcome back, everyone. I am Tina Dixon, joined alongside Jeff Moran and Mary Walsh. We are now transitioning to the women's competition, and it is the semifinals. Uh, this is where the pressure really begins. Uh, really starts, the nerves start to kick in. I've been feeling it all morning, and I'm sure the women have been as well. So let's take a look at the list, at the start list for the women that have made it this far. Here's the brackets. First up, it will be Hannah Beeman up against the young New Zealand snowboarder Zoe sadowski Sanat, and then Elena Height up against three-time free ride world champion, Marion Harity and Jeff, what do you make of the semifinals? Well, I love, as with the whole story of, of the whole natural selection so far, we've got really different backgrounds in these matchups, right? We've got Hana, who's a big mountain uh, veteran. She's been around forever, and Zoe's more of a rookie. And then Elena used to be a, a competition snowboarder, now taking it to the backcountry, and Marion with a big mountain big mountain free ride background like they're all very different and we're going to see who shines today yeah i like it it's a little bit of everything and here's the format for the women there are four riders they will go head to head the top score moves on and just like we saw with the men in the quarterfinals the women will not have a tiebreaker run um, in this, the judges are going to be looking to score them on the first two runs, and the person with the highest run score out of that will move forward to the next round. So what are the judges looking for? It's the Dave, our friend Dave we keep talking about, difficulty, amplitude, variety, execution. And as we've been saying, if you're just joining us for the women's semis right now, each run is judged on the overall appraisal. The, the judges want to see that full top to bottom. You might have a fall, you might have a bobble, but you have ample opportunity to still do very well in the scoring if you uh, put the pieces together. Yeah, and I like the creativity we saw in the men's already. Switch riding, 
paid off as we saw there with Mickelbang. All right, let's take a look at this first matchup because it is a good one. Zoe Sadowski Sanat, 19 year old Zoe Sadowski Sanat has an Olympic bronze medal, X Games gold and silver, and skill and savvy beyond her years. Um, I was super stoked to get my wildcard invite. Like, I couldn't believe it at first. I just spent the last year kind of dipping into the whole backcountry aspect of snowboarding and going on a power trip with Burden and then finding time outside training um, in the park to explore a bit more of um, the mountains that surround Wanaka in New Zealand and do a bit of filming there. So got some shots and definitely learned a lot and that's what I'm stoked to be here um, for is just to learn heaps from all these amazing riders and um, session these sick hits and yeah have heaps of fun. And she really has proven herself already making it into the semifinals here. Uh, she's not necessarily known for her backcountry skills. Zoe's blown my mind. On, on day one, like I didn't, I didn't think we'd see such powder landing prowess out of her. She looks so solid, and to bring her slope style tricks to this course, uh, it's going to give Beatman a run for her money. Oh, going down right there on her first hit. You know, I think one thing that we cannot emphasize enough is that Zoe has only been kind of in the general consciousness of snowboarding for less than four seasons. I mean, she really came out at the Olympics in Pyeongchang and made a name for herself. And she was the wild card coming into this. I think no matter what happens with her today, we're getting a nice backy right around there. Um, she she will she has shown that she definitely deserves to be here and that she is, you know, a very strong member of the future of women's snowboarding. Yep, that wildcat, that was one of her goals. Uh, I think she had some problems with that on day one, but that was a proper wildcat landing it and looking good. So she's checked that box off of her list. You know, it's funny, uh, Zoe was saying to me the other day that she actually did course inspection with Hana, and Hana was giving her some tips on how to ride, and then she said, now I'm gonna use it against her. <laughs> I was actually there walking along the side of the course with them as well, and I, I kind of saw that, I saw what was happening there. But Zoe putting her first run down. And remember, she will go back up. She does have oh, one more run. And now we are going to transition to Hana Beeman. Now, earlier in qualifiers, Hana Beeman knocked off the legendary Jamie Anderson in the quarterfinals, confirming her status as one of the favorites here. It's not a type of snowboarding that, that the general public sees a ton of. This is something that's just live and raw, and you get the best venue, you get the best riders, and it's just gonna be something super magical. So I think that's gonna really help people connect with it. The head-to-head -head format's gonna be intense, I think. It's really gonna push people. If uh, the person you're up against has a good run, it's really gonna push you to maybe go a little farther than you were initially thinking, <laughs> which is great. It's gonna be wild. I'm really excited to see how it all turns out. So you're looking at a shot right now of Hannah Beeman gearing up for her first opportunity down this course in the semifinals. You'll notice today a little uh, gear strategy in the look good, feel good aspect of uh, competing. Hana was in that pink kit heard around the world um, on day one, and now she's all black. That's a, I think that's a serious nod to her focus for today. Polar opposite matchup for Hana today, right? Day one, she was up against, uh, up against the great Jamie Anderson, two legends in the sport. And then today, uh, the other end of the spectrum, a new up-and-comer, Zoe sadowski Sanat. Uh, so she's, uh, she's definitely had to change her game plan based on how that, that lineup is for her. So Hana going down up top. So both Hana and Zoe have had falls. Uh, again, they will go back up and take one more run, and it's the highest score 
between those two runs that moves on to the finals. You know, and you can see already there is visibility issues. So break out the high intensity yellow lens. That's going to be something uh, that plays even higher into the judging today, right? If you choose to go out onto a part of the course that doesn't yet have any tracks, visibility is going to be way tougher, but the judges are going to reward that because you, you took a bigger risk. down there, Zoe, and had Hannah Beeman come down and said, you look so good in the air. I mean, that would motivate me for my second run. Uh, let's take a look at what happened in those first runs. Putting down that Wildcat, I mean, Zoe had a good first full run. I mean, if you consider that she has not been riding this kind of terrain for very long at all, that's an impressive showing. Hana, we saw her put that Wildcat down on day one, but not working out for her this time. She did stomp that back three. I'm glad I just got the speed of it. How's that uh, little finger? <laughs> well, it's my bluebird. Bluebird wax. Oh. <laughs> and as we wait for the scores, really a you know generational oh, matchup of where women's snowboarding this? is. and. Yeah. Oh, where it's going in the future. Oh, Next and look round. at that. Whoa. Just Hannah Beeman yeah. one point yeah. ahead yeah. of Zoe. Yeah. But that yeah. score just Woo. shows there is room oh. for improvement oh. for both of the women. Next heat, Elena Height. What can you say about Elena? She's an Olympian, an icon. She's been one of the greats. She's been competing for 16 years, but on this natural selection stage, Elena might be a bit of a fangirl as well. I'm just so honored to be here with some of my favorite snowboarders. And I'm so excited to watch so many of them drop into the course. I almost wish I was just a, a you know, a viewer watching it from my home. Um, but to be up there with some of these guys, like obviously Travis, uh, Bodie Merrill, Pat Moore. I mean, I think Hannah Beeman is one of my favorite female riders to watch. Um, and I think that everyone's gonna really bring kind of their own twist and style to it. So it's gonna be really cool to see how different everyone rides the course. It, it, you think about it, 16 years of competition in a half pipe. She was at the Olympics in 2006 in Italy. And now she's transitioned her skills to the back country and she's admitted it's really challenging. Now earlier in qualifiers, um, she had some problems putting the landing gear down, but now after watching some of the other women, hopefully she can learn from that and make those adjustments and um, put some things to her feet. I think a lot of people out there in the world, there's, there's kind of a misconception that like you move into the back country and it's easier, it's softer landings. And that, that is absolutely not true. Like you have to learn an entirely new skill set to be able to take the tricks you learn on the slope course or even in the pipe and bring them to the back country. You know, we laud half pipe riders for having really incredible edge control and board control. And you see it with Ben Ferguson, you see it with Elena. I mean, there's definitely something to navigating the competitive realm within the walls of the half pipe and then taking that ability to this kind of terrain. Looks like Elena kind of coming up short on another feature. I think that might play to the fact that it's a little bit flat light out there today. You can see some of our riders being a little bit more strategic about exactly where they're going. Not everybody charging down the course as much as we saw on day one. Ooh, coming up a bit short right there. And that's the speed. That's the speed element of, you know, you're approaching some of these features. You're like, wait, do I need to go a little bit faster? You just don't know. And everyone that rides, you know when you go up to the resorts, there's days Every day is not Bluebird. And so there's days where you just kind of have to learn how to adapt and figure out uh, what run is good, where to stay. And, and she knew, she knew coming into that, you know when you're about to take off that you put one extra speed check in and you still go and you kind of hope it's gonna work out. I mean, she knew that the landings are soft. So, you know, luckily she came up short and, and there, there's not high consequence, but uh, in, a, in a scenario like this, you gotta go 
and, and you got to deal with the decisions you make as you come into the takeoffs. Absolutely. So maybe she can go back up and make the adjustments on that next run. Marion Herity has won three consecutive free ride world tour titles. Her unique skill set of big mountain riding and freestyle snowboarding will make her tough to beat today. And she's sort of been that underdog that a lot of riders didn't really know coming into this. And uh, she's proving everyone that she knows how to ride a mountain. I was really excited to join the natural selection. That's a new challenge for me and I'm really happy to meet new people. Uh, to write new faces and it's going to be a crazy event and I'm really thankful for that. A win on this, this tour means a lot, I think, because there is a mix between freeride and freestyle and it's really a good um, opportunity, I think, to express myself on this kind of phase. You take a deep breath and then you drop in. You know, I think for Marion, her experience riding big mountains, riding the Alps, and just kind of being able to read the terrain and uh, find the lines that she wants to and pick her way down is really, you know, going to come in handy. We saw it on day one and we're, you know, seeing it again right now. And she's got a lot of speed here at the top of the course. <laughs> yeah, no fear right now as she's heading down. Not a lot of technical tricks so far. Getting some straight airs out of her, but she's definitely staying on her feet. Her landings have looked beautiful. Threading the needle and not quite coming through on that one through the trees. I think this is the, the dichotomy between her and Elena too, is that as you can see, Marianne is, she's kind of sending it down through the course right now but does not have, has not put down that freestyle element that Elena was going for. So this is kind of the, you know, uh, yin and yang of their matchup. Yeah. Same. Tough out there. It's tough to see. When you get done with your run, you're breathing hard, but you're like, oh, that was fun. All right, let's take a look at the recaps. I mean, important to note, you heard Elena right there comment on the visibility and that it's hard to see. I mean, the light is very flat, um, and that can really, really change things for when you're going down, as we all know. But thanks to Mother Nature, our number one player in this whole big game we've got, uh, that course got a beautiful reset. Like as you're see as we're seeing, these are all fresh tracks. These last four days have completely wiped the slate clean. So with the first run, it's Marion Herty with the lead of 45.3. Both riders do get another chance to better their scores. And this is going to be good because it's the semifinals. One more run to fight for that position in the finals you are watching the yeti natural selection here at jackson hole we are really just getting things started starting to heat up we are going to take a quick break stick with us we'll see you in a second uh, welcome back everyone to the yeti natural selection here at jackson hole i mean just a fantastic shot of the tram heading up to the mountain. Uh, these last couple days have been absolutely magical. It's also given a chance for the course to reset and get ready for this finals day. We are right now in women's semifinals heat. Uh, runs two coming up. But what's been fun over these last few days is to watch everyone's social platforms and to go through Instagram and check out what they've been doing. Also, you can check out at Red Bull USA to catch up with, uh, again, what the riders are doing, what everyone's doing at Natural Selection. Here are some of the uh, hashtags at Natural Selection, at Red Bull Snow, at Red Bull USA. And Mary, I know you guys have also been going through some of the social platforms. 
It's been really fun, especially once uh, the Natural Selection account posted the matchups to see what people's votes were, uh, you know, going in against all the different heats. And as we just saw with the women's semis, it is really anyone's game to come out on top. This is it's a challenging course. It's a challenging light, but these are incredible riders. I agree. And you know what has been really fun is to get it from such different angles, right? Like we're all getting to hang out with the riders on all these down days and, and talking to them about how they feel and what their strategy is all about. But then you go out and you check out the comments on social media and it's like people, the fans are so into this. There's heartbreak, like honest heartbreak going on because some of some people's favorite riders aren't aren't advancing. And it's like people are really invested in this whole contest. Absolutely, and the matchups do make it so unique. Uh, this is such a unique event, uh, setting itself apart from so many other contests. And let's take a look at a breakdown and really, what does set this apart? If you look at video part snowboarding, in most people's season, they'll start in Colorado or Wyoming or Utah and then work their way up to Canada. And the goal of almost everyone's season is to go to Alaska. So this tour mimics this sort of logical path. Here at Jackson Hole, first stop, we've got 16 men and eight women. Original plan was to take the top half of the field and send them off to Canada. But with COVID regulations, things are shifting. It'll be Canadian riders and focus more on a film trip. After we finish up in Canada, we'll be heading up to Alaska, Tordrilla Mountain Lodge for the finals. We'll have the top four men and the top two women from the tour competing to find out who is the best overall snowboarder on the planet. The Natural Selection Tour is changing the game right now. They decided to go with the head-to-head -head format. First of all, we seed the riders using a randomizer. As your number comes up, you get to pick when you're dropping in on the course. I will go 32nd spot. There's a lot of strategy between who you're going to ride against, how clean the course is going to be, and a lot of guys are even looking at who they might meet in the next round. Nils versus Pat Moore. Instead of being based off of just who has the best score, each rider gets two runs. A beautiful method right there. With this format, you're seeing pairings of riders that would never ever face each other in a competitive environment. There are slope style riders, backcountry filmers. Pat Moore. And it makes for a really unique field. And Nils gets it in that first one. Judging criteria is based on difficulty, amplitude. Oh, wow. Oh, oh. no. Variety. So here drops Pat again. And execution. If one rider wins one run and the other rider wins run two, it forces a tiebreaker. And that's where the real drama happens. And here we go, Nils Mindnick. All right, so cab five from Nils Mindnick into the front side 360. That's a great start for Nils. Nice method. Bonus light here down at the bottom. Oh, oh back three. Way to just keep the pressure on Pat. Starting off with a really smooth three and heading into the second pick up with some speed. Super corked backside 720. Forget the kumbaya, this is a battle. What is he gonna put down here? Front seven. Wow. So cool. <laughs> wow. At the end of the tour, we're gonna crown a champion who is going to be one of the best snowboarders in the world. 89.3 for Pat Moore. Those were finals level runs. I feel like natural selection is bringing something new and fresh and innovative, and I feel like it's the future of competitive snowboarding. You know, I think snowboarding needed an event like this. I really, really do. It couldn't have happened at a better time. Um, it's relatable. You know, the last couple of days I've been riding powder and it just is relatable for us that love to snowboard and, and you, the viewers. Uh, and also, I think it's relatable also for Stan, who is up top. And Stan, how's it going up there? I am good, Tina. Reporting live from the Temple of Stoke, kind of the last thing the rider sees before they drop in. Hey, Stan, how's it going? Hope you're staying warm up there right now. What is the word? I mean, we see from down here, it's the light is flat. You know, everyone's kind of picking their way down. What's the vibe in the, uh, in the rider tent right now? Uh, the, well, to be honest, it's about half disappointed and half excited. And I think you can tell how that's breaking down. Uh, we've already seen some, 
some upsets. I don't know. The memes uh, about these battles have been truly a show, and we're watching that play out live. Hey, Stan, this is Jeff. Um, so we're seeing a lot of camaraderie with the riders from day one to day two and all the days in between. But are you seeing any tension between anyone up there? Anyone throwing some uh, cold shoulders, like getting really intense about their drops? Nobody's getting intense. They're definitely taking it seriously. You know, this is a, a big event that these riders have been looking forward to, a stage that uh, a lot of them never had. You know, some of these contest riders are more used to uh, this sort of thing. And we're seeing riders like Blake Paul, Austin Sweeten, uh, interact with this kind of thing for the first time. All in all, I think everybody's handling it well. Hey, Stan, when you're up there, do you... Uh, what are what are the riders saying about the weather and in terms of lenses are they changing you know any lenses out or changing their equipment at all and, and preparing for what the conditions are doing um i think that they came in kind of knowing what lenses they were going to need i think the general discussion is kind of where it's soft um ben ferg put it every lip is a speed booster so what i think's happening here is you get that deep pow that we're seeing and as you hit that lip kind of launched right off it. I think that's affecting some of the riders. Interesting. Well, Ben Ferguson's already been showing us. He knows how to ride this course. So uh, listen to Ben. Hey, Stan, enjoy yourself up there. Thank you. Good stuff. Good stuff. From the Temple of Stoke. And that's the last thing you see when the riders come out of the start gate. That's what the shot looks like right there. We're going to head into semifinals. Second runs for these women in that first matchup. It's against, it's Zoe sadowski Sanat against Hannah Beeman. Zoe will drop first. Now, those first run scores, it was a 40 against a 41. So Hannah Beeman right now is in the lead, but it really is just whoever gets the highest score out of both runs moves on to the finals. Yeah, Zoe and Hannah are really in a uh, deadlock right now, pretty much. But I think what is cool is Zoe pretty much has nothing to lose. Like, she has proven herself as being very capable and really one among this, these ranks of extremely prolific snowboarders. So, you know, she can put it all on the line. I think uh, they both need to put it all on the line. I mean, those, those scores, they're pretty low. Uh, they've both got a ton of room for improvement, and they were close, right? So, um, maybe playing it a little bit conservative so they can stay on their feet, but uh, they definitely need to step up this run. Oh, Zoe going down on that first hit again. But again, as we've seen and we keep talking about it, it's a really important point for people to understand, just because you fall uh, doesn't mean you're out of the running. They're, the rest of the run is in front of her to put together you know, something to impress the judges, like hitting that bird's nest. That was a really unique feature that we've barely seen anyone hit throughout the last couple of days. So that's gonna do well for her. And then with the wildcat there, she really is making up for that slip up up top. It is interesting, right, that, I mean, she, she hit that, that butter pad, she got her, her wild cap, and then on the, it was that first hit, just a front side three that took her, that put her down. We know she's better than that. We've, she's got more in there. And going down on that second three as well, this uh, leaves the door open, as we say, for Hana to come in. Okay, so Hannah Beeman, her score was a 41. And you know, I looked at, there was, a, there was an interesting stat. So Hannah Beeman has been competing for at least two decades now. Now when Hannah Beeman did her first X Games in the year 2002, Zoe sadowski Sanat had not yet turned one years old. So that just shows the difference of experience between these two riders. But Hannah Beeman, I would think, came into the semifinals as the favorite. I think the pressure is on. She knows she can do it. She's very experienced in this terrain. She spent time in the summer helping to build this course. She also participated in the test event last year. And now this is her chance to really secure her position in the finals. Yeah, Hannah is, is 
deeply embedded in natural selection, not only preparing for it, but she's been one of Travis's, uh, you know, ri riding crew buddies for many, many years, filming with him. So she, she, like, natural selection is in her blood more than just competing these not last couple days. I mean, she's a stateswoman of the backcountry. You know, she's also, you know, in the last couple of years, emerged as a, a welcoming gatekeeper for the younger generation. So I think there is um, that added influence and pressure on her run right now. Oh, Ooh. coming up a little short. She went, she went a little slow on that rotation, didn't get the Wildcat around. But the good news is, is that we do have all of our riders are covered for this event by spot insurance. Uh, so, you know, if they go down, luckily we haven't seen anyone uh, get hurt and we're, we're hoping that doesn't happen. But it is good to know that all of our riders are covered by spot insurance. <laughs> she is putting some nice turns together, though, at this bottom. Yeah, the one thing I think is really, um, you know, that we have a lot of clarity on when she's riding is that Hana is comfortable on this course. She looks good just riding this terrain. And that's, you know, years of knowledge in the mountains, spending time in the backcountry, and just her, you know, individual talent. You know, coming into this, they both had falls, and, and Zoe had some bigger tricks. It's going to be interesting. I was like, I'm not coming around you, in time. Were you, were you just like, I kind of got lost in the whiteout. Like, I'm, I'm not moving. Yeah, I was like, it's all white. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. Oh, man. Dude. Yeah, you heard Hannah there say that she got lost in that whiteout, and that's going to happen today with these uh, visibility conditions. Even though Zoe fell on that first three up there, I mean, I think what is impressive is that she just has great style. And I think more than anything, this is really a foreshadowing of where she's going to be going in the coming years. I think it's important to recognize how fit these athletes are. Like to take slams like that and just, it is powder, but that's a hard fall, right? Like she just tomahawked twice to take falls like that and to get back up and keep sending and, and know that your body is strong enough to get you through this, like there's a lot to be said for how much work goes in behind the scenes with all of these professional athletes. So now it's in the judges' hands at this point. Unintentional front flip. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. unintentional front flip. I've done those before. <laughs> I think I did one yesterday. <laughs> Oh, oh wow. Nice. So here is the score. It is a 60. That's oh, Zoe's yeah. highest score versus a 41. Hanabima's highest score. And it will be Zoe Sadowski Sanat who will move on to the finals. She came in as a wild card and now will be competing in the finals. Wow. All right, well, we got one more heat here in the semifinals. Elena Height versus Marion Harrity. Right now, it's Marion in the lead. But Elena, she knows how to compete. She knows the mindset. She knows how to deal with the stress. At this point, she almost kind of needs to just relax, turn her brain off, and go and do what she knows how to do. One of my favorite things about Elena as a competitor is that she is a kind of, you know, go for it or bust. And I mean that in the best possible way. She does not settle for stock runs or anything like that. She always wants to make an impact and ride and impress people. So I'm really excited that, you know, she has another go to put it down. Remember, she came up short on Lando's hip. So she needs to go into that with more speed if she decides to take that same line. All right, and another thing to consider too, Elena's got tricks. That's her yes. advantage. So she's got the advantage of tricks. She has the advantage of a lot of competition. And this is it, Elena Height's second run here in the semifinals. And she's got that really good looking method. Yes. Elena has a great method. And she's been in this position before where she has come from behind and emerged victorious. So, you know, she has the focus and years of experience. And well, going kind of deep on that first hit. 
honestly, coming into that, I thought she didn't have enough speed, right? Like, that's how crazy this course is. You really need to be able to read the features that you're about to hit. Like, I thought she was going to come up short, and she kind of overshot that. Ooh. Definitely getting caught up in all that new snow on the takeoff right there. You could tell that she was not intending to try and cork that spin out. Just board got caught in the powder. I think what we're seeing too, of course, is that it is becoming more and more challenging each time a new rider drops for them just to you know, see the variation in the terrain. And uh, what we're seeing at home is not even a, a fraction as challenging as what they're viewing when they're coming downhill. Well, and also seeing other tracks. Yes, totally. Yeah, following those other tracks is going to be a huge advantage. It may not get you the, the risk uh, component that the judges are looking for, but you, you got you to weigh that out with, you know, being able to see where you're going and knowing where you're landing. So Elena Height maybe not having the run that she wanted there on... <laughs> Marion Harity. She has really been able to handle this course well. You know, I think a lot of uh, a lot of the Alps are completely above treeline, and uh, there's a lot of whiteout conditions that happen over there. So, you know, she's she's no stranger to uh, challenging light. Yeah, you think about it. She she rides in Chamonix. Yes. <laughs> That's no joke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the Jackson Hole of Europe. <laughs> <laughs> they should use that as the slogan. That might be uh, it's might a be a serious one. mountain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, going into this run, she has the lead. You know, she has the opportunity. Elena didn't quite put down that run that she wanted in her second go. You know, this is... Uh, Looking pretty good for Marion right now. But Marion better, uh, well, I was going to say she better step it up, but I'm forgetting that she actually had the higher score from the first round. So she's sitting in a good spot. She really does attack this course with a lot of speed. Yeah, you can see that big mountain prowess coming out, right? In her route finding, she's not hesitating as far as which feature she's 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 going towards like she lands and she knows exactly where she's going and she's committed to it Ooh, hanging on there that was very impressive i mean again we have to really reinforce the prowess of both of these riders both elena and marion are incredibly capable riders and uh you know having them go head to head is pretty insane it has been so fun to see how all of these head-to-head -head matchups have unfolded. I mean, this is all totally random and all totally based on each rider's uh, performance. And every single time, it's just like, yes, this is wild. Well done, well done. But that was the stylish as all. I was really ugly in the air. All right. So Elena, the pressure was on. She needed to do something here in this second run. It's really, you know, the matchup between these two women is the route finding versus the, the tricks. That's kind of really what it comes down to in this matchup. You can see Elena had some tricks that she was ready to put down, but it just wasn't working out for her with all this new snow and, and obviously the visibility's playing a tough part. So there you go. Those are the scores. Marion Herity with the high score of that heat of 54.6. <laughs> that will put her in the finals here at the natural selection. Wow. Could you have predicted this finals? I mean, this just shows you that anything can happen right now to see two of the leading ladies in the backcountry get 
get put out at, in this semifinal round, I mean, it is wild out here in Jackson. I, I think there's probably a lot of side bets that just got <laughs> lost. We, yes. we were not expecting to see both of those heats pan out this way. Absolutely not. You're taking Zoe sadowski sanat She's the wild card, an Olympic bronze medalist in big air. She's the, com she's the competitor. And then Marion Herity, she's your free ride big mountain rider. We didn't really expect to see a lot necessarily from her or even reach this far. But wow, that's what happens in snowboarding. That's what's going to happen at the natural selection. Totally. And I was talking to Hannah a few days ago, and she was saying, you know, that one of the great things about this event is that it shows the difficulty of what these riders are doing when they film video parts. She said, you know, when we film video parts, we have we have time to really make it look beautiful and make it look easy and make it look smooth. But it is hard. It is like this out there, even though it doesn't look like that in the final product. So this is, she said, this is a very accurate depiction of what it's really like. Yeah, and I think, you know, in the backcountry you're filming, you get multiple takes, right? If you don't land, you can go back up and do it again. But here, that competitive mindset is really showing up for our world champions, our, our world, our, uh, free ride world tour leaders. Like, they're bringing that high stakes mentality to the backcountry free ride uh, competition. And you also have to remember that there has never been an event like this for women on a competition yes. level. Well, right now we are gonna go uh, and speak to one of the competitors that is going to be in the finals. Uh, Zoe, hey. congratulations. Thank you, I'm pretty stoked. You know, I talked to you uh, when, we, when you first got here and you said that you had had a busy schedule leading up to this event, uh, but you were just so thrilled to be here. At that moment, would you have expected to have made it this far? Um, yeah, not at all. Like when I got the wild card invite, I was so stoked and so honored to be riding along amongst these other riders who I've looked up to for so long. And yeah, to make it this far, I had I had no like no realization that this was going to happen. I just wanted to come here and uh, ride some lines that I was stoked on and just have heaps of fun because this is like the sickest course ever made. So yeah, I'm just stoked to be here. Zoe, uh, one of your goals was to land a wildcat. You did that. Congratulations, right? That the big box checked off, and here you are finding yourself in the finals. Do you have any new goals for your finals run? Yeah, um, definitely land a run and stop putting bomb holes in some of the landings. I feel pretty guilty about that. I was just really wanting to land uh, that run I just tried to put down, but snow conditions were a bit trickier than I expected. It's a lot heavier and, like, Whenever you get stuck in someone's track, it's like bouncing you around. But I think the rider's left side of the venue is a bit softer, so I might head that way um, in finals. I don't know. Zoe, insane riding out there. Congratulations on making it up to uh, the finals. Um, so you've got the Olympics under your belt. You just came off X Games. Now you're guaranteed podium here at Natural Selection. You know, are we going to see a rail part next? What's happening here? <laughs> Um, I don't know, like my sights are fully set on the Olympics. I love riding, free ride and shredding backcountry and shooting. But yeah, over the next year, my, my eyes are on the big O and yeah, I'm so happy to be here. And of course, I'd love to do this again in the future. Um, so yeah. Hey, it's been so fun to watch you. Uh, keep it up and best of luck there in the finals. Thanks so much, Zoe. Thank you. So yeah, I love that. She's just so excited to be here. She has goals now for the finals. Uh, she's accomplished her goal. She does have the Olympics on her mind for next year. But right now, it is all about the natural selection in the finals. It is Zoe sadowski sanat up against Marion Herity. We will take a quick break and be right back with the men's semifinals. Welcome back everyone to the Yeti Natural Selection live from Jackson Hole. Some fantastic shots here and what a mountain this is and a perfect venue to be hosting the Natural Selection combining competition with backcountry. It's unique. Nothing's really been done like this before with both men and women. We've seen some fantastic riding already. We've had some fantastic moments already. Uh, one of those moments for me was watching Travis Rice congratulate Mark McMorris after Mark took him out. 
And uh, Mark is up at the top of the course. Hey, Mark. Hi. How's it going? Uh, first of all, I've seen you compete at so many events, but to now be back at the natural selection, uh, you will be competing in the semifinals. But more than that, you went up against Travis Rice. You beat him, and then he, he was congratulating you at the bottom. How was that for you? Yeah, Travis Rice is uh, a great sport, and that's how we roll in snowboarding. We congratulate each other, win or lose. And um, I'm just thankful he's hosting this amazing event in his hometown. I'm so glad to survive the heat that no one thought I would survive. It feels insane. Um, in the semifinals, got another tough heat with Mikkel Bang, but really, really proud and happy with the way I've been riding. Hey, Mark, obviously you have nerves of steel when it comes to competing and, you know, your home usually is slope style and big air. What is your mindset in this arena that is so unique and different than traditional competitions? Yeah, it's um, it's a total different sort of nervousness. I'm just really focused on trying to um, hone in on each feature at a time and just ride smooth and try and fluidity is everything when riding lines in backcountry. So trying to keep it fluid and trying to uh, land and keep my speed up and yeah, just, just ride to the best of my ability and what I think um, people want to see. Make snowboarding look fun. Well, Mark, you're definitely making snowboarding look fun. You've come a long way since 2012 at uh, Supernatural. Any insights into your next run? You got a, a specific trick you can let us in on or are you keeping everything a secret? Honestly, I kind of take it as I go. Um, I think maybe going to go that same line, similar tricks. That cab five on the last one into that little pocket tranny felt really cool. Um, we'll see what happens different, but I, I literally don't know. I might try and just ride smooth and do a sim similar run to what I did uh, in my second run of the quarterfinals. Yeah. Well, Mark, we're going to let you go. Thanks so much, and uh, looking forward to seeing your next runs. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Enjoy. Cheers. All right, so for the men's semifinals, format looks like this. We have four men. They will each take two runs. The top score from those two runs moves on to the finals. And again, we're looking at the full top to bottom. The judges are really looking for that full appraisal of how the riders are riding. You know, a bobble or a fall here isn't going to count someone out because we're all about Dave. Difficulty, amplitude, variety, and execution all put together on who navigates best from top to bottom. All right, we're going to kick things off, go right to the top for a Jackson Hole local, Blake Paul. And first of all, this first heat, Blake Paul against Ben Ferguson, two really completely different riders. I am really excited to see this heat. Uh, I got to turn to you, Jeff, because you know Blake Paul. Blake, Blake's the uh, the backcountry prince, trying to be crowned the king for <laughs> sure. Um, he he's just always had the smoothest style, and it's been so cool to watch Blake come up through the years and and how he's taken that all mountain prowess, that all mountain style that he has, and really turned it into these much bigger tricks and really start putting together like insane video parts. And then here we are today finding Blake, hometown hero, in the semifinals of natural selection. I mean, it's appropriate though, right? <sighs> it's poetic. <laughs> Blake is also just a very poetic rider. You know, coming off of the quarterfinals when Ben was facing Sage, and they both had that competitive background. This is an interesting aspect to the Blake and Ben matchup, where Blake is not a competitive snowboarder. You know, he has been filming video parts uh, for years now, and that is going to, you know, potentially play a role with that, uh, you know, can he find that same focus that, you know, Ben is used to drawing from. I, I got to say, though, after watching, uh, you know, Ben's first runs, like I think Blake has it in, in his head that he needs to not only be consistent, but I think he's going to need to step it up a little bit. We saw some super creative tricks out of Ben on his first runs and a lot of consistency. So let's see what Blake's got for us coming up here. Great. He's got that crippler again, very the, the, the Blake Paul uh, approved crippler. If I mean, oh, sorry. I was going to say, if they're taking requests, oh, I wanted to see a, a backside 
rodeo seven out of Blake. That's one of his <laughs> signature moves that looks so good. Had a little bit of trouble on that backside seven. It looked like he got a little overcorked on kind of the second spin. Top of the run, though, was so smooth. I mean, just classic Blake Paul finesse. And an effortless wildcat <laughs> to finish it off. Okay. So the one mistake, but other than that, it was really good. And he did step his tricks up. Yes. So windy on that one. Ben Ferguson. I mean, he has looked on fire today. Absolutely on fire. He's already posted the highest score we've seen so far in the 90s. He, a lot of switch riding from Ben. And remember, he comes from that competitive half pipe background. But I think he is in the right place at the right time for him and his riding. Yeah, we heard Tiber talk about it earlier today. You know, Ben is a very competitive snowboarder and he has laser focus and he is in the headspace right now of natural selection. We saw it in his first run, very, very strong. And uh, pretty much I would assume he is poised to uh, take that same stance again right now. One of, one of Ben's goals coming out here was just to simply prove that he could hang with this crowd. And I think that has changed. He went from not only proving he can hang to he could be the one standing at the top of the stairs at the end of today. <laughs> Looks like he went down pretty hard on that. That was that switch kind of switch backside rodeo. Looked like he was trying to get switch backside five rodeo. Uh, one of the higher risk tricks that we've seen and one of the more creative tricks that we've seen out of anyone so far. Such a smooth backside three right there. Honestly, I think that there's a lot to be said for not grabbing your board sometimes. Like, it's all about style, and he can make a no grab back three look just as good as a back three with a grab. Yeah. I mean, isn't that MFM made a career off of you know, really nice <laughs> no did. grab airs? There you go. Very good point. Perfect Holy reference. Yeah. yeah. Let's take a look at the Yeti recap. This is Blake Paul. Again, just one of the most fun snowboarders to watch ride. So, so fluid, so smooth. Looked like Blake hooked his back edge on that back seven. Definitely sent him way off kilter. And then Ben Ferguson. Not totally making it around on that back rodeo. Switchback rodeo, excuse me. Yeah, having some trouble on that switchback five as well. So coming into second runs, these guys are definitely both going to be looking to get some more consistency under their belt. And they can both do it. Absolutely. Oh. Whoa. So right now, Blake Paul has the advantage with that 54. But remember, Ben Ferguson earlier scored a 90. So he's already proven himself on this course. Blake, All right. Blake's not sitting back on no. that 54. No. 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 Okay, next up. Yep. Semi-final heat number two. Mickle Bang against Mark McMorris. Now, Mickle, I mean, what a heat that he had in the quarterfinals going up against Pat Moore. Uh, the reaction on his face sort of said it when the scores came out, and he was like, I, I won. I guess I'm moving on. I, I think that was a little bit of a surprise. Yeah, I mean, again, we talked about how it came down to the intricacies of his run, the switch method, the unique and creative uh, tricks that he chose. And I like that we've got the team uh, the team matchup here, the Burton team riders up yes. against each other. Yes, yeah, part of the, the industry alliance here at Natural Selection. Both Burton riders, both featured in uh, the recent team movie, One World. You know, and both long-standing members of that team, like we've, we've said before, Mikkel 
started as a Burton Smalls back when he was, you know, much shorter than he is now. <laughs> you know, in one aspect of this event, uh, a critical element of the Natural Selections mission is to promote and progress snowboarding, as well as the brands that had support these athletes. 15 endemic brands have made up the Tours Industry Alliance, and that includes Oakley, Burton, LibTech, Quicksilver. And really, the alliance is to provide the athletes in the Tour with resources so they can go out on the mountain and do their magic. Magic is a good word to describe Mikkel right here. I mean, known for having some of the best style in snowboarding. We saw it in the first run with that switch method. Ooh. Oh! You know, again, big shout out to Spot Insurance, which is uh, in keeping all of these athletes safe in case of falls or anything that happens and can happen when you're riding natural terrain like this. So. Really appreciative of Spot today. Good to see Mikkel back up and riding strong. Backside five, that's one of the harder tricks, I'd say, in this course, landing switch and continuing to ride switch. You know, you go back and you look at that trick that put him down, like he meant to tap that rock. I don't think he meant to run right into it as hard as he yes. did, but that's going, like on his second run, if he keeps that up, that's gonna be huge for him because no one is taking that line. That's what I thought as well. At first, I was like, oh, I think this is going to be something really interesting. Oh, no. Um, but just seeing him get creative like that is, is really rad. That, that's something he was trying to do. Huh? Yeah. But, uh, huh? Don't ruin it. doesn't look that bad. Checking out the base of his board right there. Make sure it's OK. What a cool line, though. If he can get that, what a cool line. Okay, Mark McMorris already took out Travis Rice earlier today. He said it's an honor to be part of this event. He also said, I don't really know for sure what I'm going to do. Right, we'll be learning right along with Mark. As he makes decisions, we're right there with him. But arguably, one of the best slope style competitive riders in the history of snowboarding. Mark's already made his mark, pardon the pun, <laughs> on snowboarding. This would just be a cherry on top. I got to take some laps with Mark yesterday uh, through Dick's Ditch, and, you know, there's, it was tracked out. There's so many hits for anyone unfamiliar with Jackson. It's a natural half pipe with so many hits on any, both sides, all the way down. And to see his ability at just sending mini spins on these side hits, it was so amazing. He's just, he's, he's flawless. I heard there were some heavy dick stitch sessions going down the oh, yeah. last few days. All right, Mark starting off with a wildcat and no problem landing that and riding away clean. Beautiful backside seven, getting a little bit off access. Making it look pretty easy right now. Ooh. I think that might have been my fault. <laughs> Down on the front seven. The announcer curse. We've heard about that. Hey, but I have to say, is that a little bit of sun coming out? It does look brighter up there right now. It's still snowing in the announcer booth, but it looks brighter <laughs> up there. Underflip for McMorris coming into the to the uh, base here. Half cab front one, backflip. Wow. I'd say he was squeaking oh. everything he could get out of that run. Yes, 100%. Yeah, yeah, that was gnarly though. Oh, yeah. he's home. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good job, yeah, buddy. You too, man. Oh, it's too long on that front seven, I think. Oh, yeah, on the turtle? Turtle, yeah. I want to see the base of Nichols board. <laughs> I'm just excited to see if he can pull that off this run. Look at that. Yeah, it looked like he was just trying to run his nose across that rock and he went a little bit too hard into it. I'm hoping that uh, whatever damage he did to his board isn't going to slow him down. So much style and switch riding from him. And then Mark McMorris came in for his first run of two in the semifinals. 
looked so strong up top. I mean, this is a tough one. I get, you know, this, these two guys, this heat could go very much either way. They both have very different styles of riding, but they're equally as strong. You know, if I if I were a betting man, I'd, I'd say this one's probably going to go to Mark. I would I would guess Mark. Uh, Mickle, super creative on that rock ride, but it really took him down. He was stopped. So Mark had quite a few more tricks. Oh, so for run one, Mark with a 64.6, Mickle with a 60, and that's with falls. Love seeing the judges reward that creativity. I mean, again, we've mentioned it, but this is what makes this contest so unique is that th we're really looking for that inventive riding that celebrates what these snowboarders love to do. This is not about stock stuff. I think... Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, you know, for Mark, in his slope style runs, you see backside triple cork 1440s. You know, he was the first rider to really be doing that trick. You don't see that up on this course. And it's really refreshing, you know, for me to see him approach the mountain and snowboarding completely different than maybe what he's used to or maybe what, you know, a lot of viewers are used to seeing from him. Yep, I agree. And, and to Mary, to your point, I think it's really important to understand that the judges are rewarding creativity. Like Mikkel went down, I didn't think his, his score was going to be that high. And, and the judges liked it. They like seeing something new. We've seen sevens and we've seen fives. Yeah, well, we have Liam up at the top. He has been working around the clock. He is the COO of uh, Natural Selection. Liam, I got to say thank you for all the hard work that you've been putting into this event. I know so many people want to say thank you to you as well. Uh, but just really quick, how, how's it going for you up there? Well, I mean, the sun is finally coming out. We were looking for this weather all day, and it's finally happening. We've got men's semifinals and finals still to come with men's and women's. Really excited. Hopefully the visibility helps them out. It's definitely been challenging conditions today with the wind, the flat light, variable snow. So hopefully with a little bit more, a little bit more light on the course, they're going to be dealing just with the snow conditions. Good. Well, Liam, we know you've been running around ragged for quite a while now, making sh sure this event goes off smoothly. Are you getting to sit back a little bit up there and, and just take in these insane runs? Yeah, I've been spending some time with the riders up in the athlete tent, ba bouncing back and forth between the, the start here and the athlete tent up at the top. The vibes are good. People are hyped. It's nice to finally see people, you know, express their, their own selves on this course, do what they want to do. Um, you know, these, these rivalries didn't really exist before today, but we've got some really interesting matchups coming up, and I think everybody's excited to see who wins. You know, uh, first off, congrats on bringing to life this behemoth of an event. You know, you we see Travis riding and competing, but you work with him. How is he to work with? Travis is an incredible visionary. You know, he always comes with the best ideas at the last minute. This archway, you know, this event, Everything we work on together, we're really yin and yang. He's a little all over the place. I'm a little more details, but that's where the magic happens. You know, the idea and then the ability to bring the idea to fruition, working together. You know, that, that's been a beautiful partnership between myself and Travis over the years. Hey, Liam, thank you so much. Uh, try to enjoy some of the snowboarding moments up there. I know that you've been just so busy uh, leading up to this event. But again, thank you. And we're all so happy to be here and be part of this. Well, thank you guys for being here. Thanks to everybody watching. Thanks to all the riders, all the sponsors, Jackson Hole Mountain Resort, and everybody for supporting this. We wouldn't be here without you. Awesome. All right. Enjoy. Thanks, Liam. Oh, he's a busy man. All right. We are going to take a quick break. And when we return, men's semifinals, run twos. Some pretty heavy matchups. Coming up next, stick around. Welcome back, everyone, to the Yeti Natural Selection here in Jackson Hole. What a day. What a day. And we are about to get way with men's semifinals, run number two. But before that, the conditions look like they're changing a little bit. We're starting to see a little bit of sun, which is fantastic news. Maybe uh, that prayer at the very top of the show paid off. Uh, Stan, you're at the top. What is the report from up there? 
Well, uh, apparently someone up there heard Austin's uh, sun song this morning. That is true. It is breaking. The tent has been good. Um, I did watch Trap kind of showing Mickle Bang a new line. If you don't know, Mickle Bang is kind of covered head to toe in tattoos, but in that run, definitely bringing a new meaning to the rock and roll. <laughs> that, was, that was very good. Appreciate that dad joke, Stan. Um, so we have two two matchups right now that are very, very close um, in terms of the scores and where the riders could go from here. What's uh, what's the inside intel um, between the, the Blake-Ben matchup right now? Tough to say. You know, obviously, uh, the nickname for Blake has been Bird Bone. You know, the kid is light. And uh, we've seen him stay consistent all day. Ben Ferguson, just a powerhouse. We saw him kind of take down what some people would have called the titan of this event, Sage Kotzenberg. So this could go either way, really. Hey, Stan, we, I mean, we know what riders we're watching today in the in the quarters and semis. Do we have a lot of the other riders that may have been eliminated on day one? Or are they hanging out up there and, and partaking in the vibe? Oh, of course. Yeah, we got Ejac, Elias. It's uh, there's everyone wants to be here. This is not something you're going to want to miss. So, yeah, people are kicking back and who knows, maybe enjoying that they just get to watch the show. <laughs> hey, Stan, how tempted are you to grab your board and just drop in? Um, well, time will tell. I think <laughs> I'm, if I get the opportunity, it's going to be hard to say no. Yeah. Hey, Stan, thanks so much. Uh, hopefully that sun stays out here and we'll catch up with you later on uh, in the show. <sighs> I really do hope that sun stays out. I know the riders do yeah. as well. Well, also, because we do have a s internet like going crazy on the Stan Zach Nigro matchup that uh, Natural Selection also shared. So if the sun comes out, maybe there's going to be opportunity for that later in the day. <laughs> After. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good stuff. Uh, you know, one thing to mention is at the end of this tour, whoever wins the tour, they get a car. The Bronco Sport. I mean, awesome. think about that. Like, you're going to Jackson Hole, you're snowboarding, you're riding powder, you get to choose your own line. Uh, really, these are the best riders that we have chosen for this. They've put together the puzzle pieces. Um, and then you continue on the tour, and at the very end, it's like, yep, yeah, congratulations. Drive away happy. It, it's, a cool, it's a cool truck. I've seen it around. It's awesome. <laughs> It's one of those trucks that, like, in the morning, um, before everyone wakes up and gets to the mountain, you want to be in that truck and riding <laughs> to the mountain and saying, see ya. Uh, all right, we're going to get back to the competition right now. Men's semifinals. <sighs> Run number two for heat number one. And this is Blake Paul against Ben Ferguson. Blake Paul, the local. He's from Jackson Hole. He's poetic, as you said it, Mary. He's smooth, needs to clean a couple things up in this run because he cannot let his guard down knowing that Ben Ferguson will be coming up right after him. And you see Blake's got those clear lenses on. Don't see that very often. So, I mean, that testament to the visibility up there right now. If Blake cleans up that seven and puts yeah. it down, uh, combine that with his crippler, and he's got a wildcat in there. I don't know if he's going to do the same tricks, but that's a heavy run. That's a contender against uh, against Ben. And this is probably the best shot that we've seen in terms of visibility of the course. So now he's going into that, able to see better, able to see other tracks better, maybe able to judge his speed a little bit better, and like you said, get that seven. But uh, pressure's on. It seems like the visibility has been more of a challenge for the riders than the wind. We know it's windy here right now, but it, it, you haven't heard too many people talking about that having an, an impact. It's, it, I think they're really excited, though, that we can start seeing some of those tracks on the course and get a little bit more depth perception as they're moving through the, through the course. Oh, depth perception, eh? You like that oh. little drop? <laughs> a little drop of depth perception. I know a guy. Wow. Oh, Blake staying on his feet. Gets the crippler. There we go. A good old fashioned mute grab. That, that one went right to my heart. I love that. I mean, he's got such good style. So fun to watch snowboard. And he's putting together a great run right now. So he's got the front side three, the crippler, the back side 360. Oh. oh. 
going down on that one. So he, but op he opted for the three instead of the seven, and then had the uh, had a tough time on the Wildcat. <laughs> So the door's open. The door's open for Ben. So if Ben can do what he did earlier in the qualifying rounds and score in that high 80s and 90s, I mean, we've already seen him put together some really good runs top to bottom on yeah, this course. Yeah, we, we know he has it. It's it's there. He's done it twice already. Uh, his last run um, in, in, in this round wasn't his best, but we know Ferguson's got it in him. Seen him drop into the half pipe so many times at the Olympics, so many other events. But to be able to watch Ben Ferguson drop into the natural selection event is something very special. He's got a certain intensity about his riding. He's like he's low and he's powerful. I know we've used that word a lot over the last couple days, but that's a that's a characteristic of a lot of these riders. And here he goes coming in switch into this first hit. Cab five looked like he was trying to poke it out and tap that tree. Front side 360. Ooh, nice wow. powder turn. And that's what the judges want to see is that that finesse in between the hits. Okay, Ben's having a great start. Top half of the course just nailing it. I feel like Ben's taking a little bit more of a conservative right route right now. Like he's putting down good tricks, but it's not the, like the first runs we saw today. You're right. You're absolutely right. Nell's that backside 720 with another just fantastic powder wow. slash at the bottom. Oh, that wow. was great. Exactly. Don't forget to have fun in between the hits. All right, so let's break down these two runs. Blake, Ball, Blake Paul came into this. We thought he was going to do a 720. He, he needed to land that 720. The top of the course was great. Held on to the crippler. This is going to be a game of nuance right now because Blake had a really strong start, a little bobble there in the landing, and of course the fall later on the course. And, you know, Ben kind of did the top to bottom full pull. So it's the small, the small aspects that are going to really affect who takes this uh, second run right now. I totally agree because the judges know Blake can put, the, they've already seen him put those tricks down smoother and cleaner. He didn't go down on them but they didn't look as good as, as he's done in the past. And then Ben took <laughs> what you said, a little bit more conservative of an approach, which still wasn't that conservative. It's all relative, right? Back <laughs> exactly. <lift> sevens, like. <laughs> oh, but man, he put together some nice stuff. And that's part of being in that second drop position where, you know, he's already seen what Blake has done and he can kind of ratchet it up or down depending on what he feels like he needs to do. There's still definitely more from both of those guys that we have not seen today. But only one will get the chance to show us. So there you go. Ben Ferguson comes with, in with an 85. He will move on to the finals. You know, that right there though, I mean, even though Blake Paul isn't going on to the finals, he still had a fantastic showing at this event. Absolutely, yes. to make it all the way to the semifinals here in his hometown, yeah. like, that's a big move. It's huge. Completely, completely. I mean, no shame in top four, not at all. No shame in being top 16 here, <laughs> really. No shame in even being invited <laughs> to this event. It's just an exactly. honor to be invited and be part of this event. Okay, Micklebank, second run. This is it, this is his final chance. Are we gonna see that rock tap attempt again? Because I feel like the people would love to see it. The judges, I'm sure, would love to see it. I would love to see it. You know, and it's interesting. This is where, from a rider's perspective, you're like, 
Because a lot of times, riders just want to get the trick. They're like, no, that's, I'm determined to do that. Or because it's a competition and maybe it didn't work out the first time, he completely switches it up. Yeah, I think over the course of the two days of competition, we've seen Mikkel taking some of the most unique lines and putting down some of the most unique tricks. Like uh, the switch method, we keep going back to it. That one was huge. The switch back five he did on day one was one of the most beautiful tricks we saw of anyone. And then, of course, trying to get a rock rider, or at least tap it. Like these are going a long way for him, and that's why we're still watching him. Here he comes into that hit. Oh, and he holds it. on to it. Yes. That was incredible. I mean, if anyone watching today was not familiar with Mikkelbang before now, definitely look up some of his video parts from the past. This Norwegian just has the most effusive style out there. And you'll see the buildup of that creativity that led up to this moment today. And there you go. He did a backside five, and he rode switch the whole way down until he found another hit to do a cab five. If he had just switched it around in his run and gone back to forward, that really wouldn't have been against him, but he didn't. He stayed switch riding powder, and that's hard to do. Such a great point. Switch powder is tough. Did you tap the rock? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, you. Yeah, good riding, guys. Oh man, man, amazing. Yeah, your run was really good. All right. Now after that, we've got Mark McMorris, who has yet to drop. He currently has the highest score, but really, he just needs to land everything go top to bottom, and do what Mark McMorris knows how to do, snowboard. Completely, he's got uh, his girlfriend Coco Ho, professional surfer here, I'm sure cheering him on from the bottom. She's been there watching the replay with him every night. Props to her for doing that. <laughs> but you know, if Mark's paying attention, he watched Mickle's run, and he knows all of the intricacies and the nuances. He knows that Mickle uh, put down that rock tap. He knows that he landed a, a back five into a switch back five, or was it cap five? Like, those are a big deal. Like, Mark is not about to, to just lay back and, and put down an easy run. And don't forget about just riding powder switch. Riding powder switch. All right, Mark McMorris on course. Yeah, such a different headspace. I mean, usually if he's drop in last in this kind of situation. He's like, okay, there was a 12, a double cork 10. Now it's like, okay, there was a rock tap and switch turns. <laughs> I'm nervous. There we go, back seven, looking as clean as ever. Oh, wow. Beautiful front side 720, holds on to it. It's a combo we've seen, and, and, but he's got it dialed, and it's still, that's going to do well for him in this run. I mean, you know, we can't forget that while Mark has been upholding his position as, you know, arguably the most successful contest rider in the world currently, he is consistently filming in the back of the tree year in and year out. This. Yeah, nice one. Yeah. Holy shit. Holy. Holy. <laughs> Love seeing that posse assemble at the bottom. That's awesome. All right, let's take a look at Mickle's run. Gets the rock tap. I think that's going to be huge. That is. You know, that's going to be a trick of the day, I think, uh, contender. And I think that's going to be really rewarded because that's kind of what natural selection is all about, finding those unique opportunities for uh, really, really sick tricks. And then Mark McMorris watched that run, came in, landed the 720s. This is a nail biter. This is a total nail biter, right? Like we were talking on day one, 720s are arguably an easier trick in this in this scenario. And Mark had two. Mikkel was landing switch and taking off switch. But Mark's execution, though, 
Remember, the judges take into account just the execution overall control. This is a brutal, brutal situation for the judges. Wow. Uh oh. Plug in those scores. Wow, dude. Good job, Ray. So safe. Mark McMorris is your winner in heat two of the semifinals, and he will be going up against Ben Ferguson in the finals. Wow. I mean, this is amazing. That, you know, never thought we'd see this match of a competition. I know we've said it before, but once again, this is going to be a ridiculous finals. Yeah, it's like, how do we take a slope style star and have them compete against a pipe star? Let's do it in the back country that's actually in the front country. It makes perfect <laughs> sense. It's fantastic. I absolutely <laughs> love it that these two are riding and going to be matching up against each other in the finals here at Natural Selection. I think we've got a rider up top. Uh, as we wait for that rider, but really, I mean, Okay, I've seen both of these riders compete on the Olympic level, at the Olympics. You know, Mark McMorris has two bronze medals in slope style. Ben Ferguson has finished fourth. He finished fourth in Pyeongchang, so he's a fantastic half-pipe rider. Both of them now in the backcountry, showing us their skill set on a snowboard and matching it up against each other. And I think worth noting that Ferg is, you know, a people's champion type snowboarder when it comes to competitions, but he has yet to get on the top of a podium in any major competition. Mark, of course, I don't think he, I don't know if he could hold all of the gold medals that he has in his <laughs> arms. It's probably a bit heavy, but this is really interesting because, you know, this is, this is Ben's first opportunity to get on the podium. You're exactly right. Oh, you're the exactly top of the podium. Right. The very, the very yes. top of Tip the top. podium. Yes. And speaking of Ben Ferg, we have him at the bottom of the course. Uh, ben, how is it going? Um, first of all, congratulations on just some fantastic runs already. You will now be going into the finals, uh, matching up against Mark McMorris. What are your initial thoughts on that? Um, honestly, it's been going so fast, there's not even enough time to think about it. But uh, I'm excited. I can't believe I've made it this far. Super hyped. It's been really fun. Yeah, stoked to take a couple more runs of that amazing course. Hey, Ben, uh, so you don't have to give us the details, but do you have any uh, tricks in your bag that you're holding out for these final runs? Dude, honestly, I'm going to have to go up there and just free ball something. I don't really know. <laughs> I'm going to have to pull something out of my... You know, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to have to fully just like come up with something once I get up there. That seems to be a theme for a lot of the riders. There's not a not a huge uh, pl game plan ahead of time. Everybody's feeling it out as they go. Yeah, I mean, it's so like wild and you get you get to watch where other people go and where the like tracks are. So lots of strategy. You kind of just got to make a split second decision, which is kind of exciting. <laughs> that is exciting. Ben, you've been posted up in Jackson for uh, for a while now. Um, you know, do you think that uh, riding here a little bit extra before the competition started kind of helped you to get comfortable in this area? If not, you know, of course, not on the course, but in these mountains? I mean, I don't know. If, I think I've just been riding my snowboard so much this year. Like after quarantine and everything, we were super excited to just like get back out of the resort. Mount Bachelor was amazing this early season. Just like got a ton of runs in, ton of days in out there, and then came out to Jackson early and have been sledding and riding natural terrain as much as I can. So I think it's definitely like helped my snowboarding. I've just been snowboarding as much as I can. And I think that's the best thing you can do to be a good snowboarder. I mean, it's absolutely true. Just totally. go snowboarding. Yeah. Hey, Ben, um, we're really looking forward to the finals. Congratulations on making it there. We're gonna let you go and um, thanks again. Awesome, thank you so much, guys. Cheers. Just go snowboarding. That's how you get to be a good snowboarder. It's not wrong. Time time in the water, as they say, but time in the mountains. All right. So we are going to move on, uh, talk a little bit about the format as we head into the finals, because it is going to be a little bit different uh, for the finals. We do now have the tiebreaker element of that. 
Yes, the tiebreaker is back. I mean, this puts some extra heat into the finals right now. You know, this is a very consequential, uh, this is a very consequential round for both the men and the women. And so they have that potential opportunity to have a third go and someone is going to take two out of three in order to be crown champion. Yeah, so each rider will take two runs if they need to go, if the first rider wins both runs, then they basically win. So it's really the best two out of three. And then the judging criteria looks like this. Uh, Dave, Dave's our friend. Remember, Dave is our friend. Welcome back, T-Bird. Uh, difficulty, amplitude, variety, execution. And really, I think what I've noticed is the creativity element of this event really comes into play, control and execution. Yes, I mean, this is the heart of snowboarding. Natural selection, I think we have seen over these two days of competition that this is very much the beating heart of snowboarding. And as such, the judges, the audience, down here in the announcer booth, we want to see the riders out there doing what they do best, getting creative, being inventive. That's why they are here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're going to talk now about this first heat. We're going to get right into it right into the finals. This is the women's final here at Natural Selection. Marion Herity up against Zoe sadowski Sanat. Marion, the three-time free ride world champion will now be showing us her skill set here at Natural Selection. Uh, let's hear a little bit more from her. I grew up uh, near to Chanrous and now I'm living close to Chamonix and the mountains are crazy. It's about big mountains there. I think the mental is the most important in, in our sport, because if you are the body ready for that and not the mind, it's not good for you. And for sure, I, I like to work on, on the mind for that. Well, whatever she's been doing, it's been paying off. I gotta say, this is a huge contrast in approach to how these riders ride this course. Marion Herity dropping in now, of course, takes a little bit more of a big mountain approach to it, whereas Zoe sadowski Sanat is the freestylers, freestyler. So Marion making her way down this course. The goofy-footed rider from France, grew up riding Chamonix. And coming up a little short on aircraft carrier right there. But you can really see like her strength on her board that she can pull that landing through. Not quite on that one, unfortunately. If I could critique one thing in Marion's uh, semifinals and the first run of finals, it's that this is an all-mountain freestyle contest. And she is not grabbing her board on a lot of these straight airs. So how Zoe sadowski sanat answers back right now, if I'm Zoe at the top, I'm thinking, okay, tricks. This is going to be about tricks is how, is it, how I'm going to win this title. Well, and we've already seen from Zoe, too, like she's been attacking this course. That first run she did in quarter, quarterfinals um, on day one, she was going so fast and so big, and then she was implementing her tricks. So, But right now we're looking at Marion Herity's first run. She's finishing things up. So, you know, two falls in that run. She was going fast, but... There is opportunity for Zoe to come in. If she can put down a run like t was saying, that has a couple solidly landed freestyle hits, she is going to be rewarded for that And in this matchup today. Okay, so Zoe sadowski Sanat, she was the wild card that came into this event. She told us earlier she's been having so much fun. It's been paying off. She's gearing up now for the finals. This is what she had to say. Yeah, I'm so excited. Like, after scoping the course with a good crew and, um, yeah, taking a look at all the hits, I'm super stoked and, yeah, just can't wait to ride the thing. My goal coming here was to um, do a wildcat somewhere off a hit that I've never hit before, straight into competition. So, yeah, try to do that. Zoe sadowski Sanat about to drop in. Our youngest competitor in the female field, only 19 years old. She's a relative rookie, both in the competitive environment and in the backcountry. But let me tell you, all of the females that rode in the natural selection, every single one of them said, I never overlooked Zoe sadowski Sanat. Well, if you watched her, if you've ever had a chance to watch her just hit big air jumps in a big air contest, she is so powerful. 
and she's really taken it to this course. And that's what I'm talking about. She's grabbing her board. There's a huge oh. wildcat oh. Oh. from Zoe. She hangs on there. That was awesome. She, she honestly, I think, must have one of the most powerful cores in all of snowboarding. She can really hang on to a landing. And um, I've seen her go deep on big jumps right there. I mean, she can come through. Getting a little slash in there. So Zoe is definitely taking a more freestyle approach here in women's finals at the Yeti Natural Selection. Going for the Great Wall, backside oh. three, and ragdolling in the landing. However, that's a strong run in comparison with yes. Marion's. Yeah, I do think that the judges are going to like what they see there because of that top section. Um, you know, that's just, she was creative. She was solid. And we've talked. Yeah, that's a big. Oh, yeah, I gotta come and see you anything. <laughs> and we've talked earlier, too, just about um, the overall appraisal of a run. And yep. in this case, this was the first rider, Marion Herity, who dropped in. She had some errors, but was missing the crabs and the tricks that are needed in this freestyle backcountry event. And you say freestyle right as Zoe sadowski sanat is flying through the air. Huge wildcat there, loops out a tiny bit, and then this backside 360 did not go her way. However, I'm gonna give the run to Zoe. If I'm a judge, which I am not, yeah. I think Zoe took the right approach in finals today. I would agree with that. I think that it's a strong showing, and I, I think she will be rewarded for that situation. I really wanted to see that landing, how she, you know, what happened on that, and will she go back up and do that again? I mean, Zoe puts down that back three, and it's a score in the in the mid to high 70s, maybe 80s. How great would that run be? Yeah. For everything that she already did up at the top of the course. And there you go, yeah. T-Bird. Okay. Yep, Zoe sadowski sanat with a 70 on that first run. That is with a fall. Yep, that's a commanding lead going into run two. Would love to see what she can score if she can put that down. You know, she's really impressed me. I oh, mean, yeah. all week. Yeah, yeah, Zoe is an incredible rider. And it, it's one of those things where she doesn't have a lot of competitive experience, even though she's one of the best slope style riders in, and big air riders in the world. But maybe that's playing to her advantage up yeah. there. Maybe it's a little bit less pressure. You look at Marion back to back to back free ride world tour titles on the world stage. This is a different event than than those. There's that expectation there. And, you know, we've talked about this earlier. My first introduction to Zoe was in 2018 at the Pyeongchang Olympics, she came into the big air contest, finished third, a bronze medal with a switch backside 900 on the podium with Jamie Anderson and Anna Gasser. And everyone really was like, oh, this girl's good. She's good. She's good. Yep. I remember doing a double take and being like, wait a minute, who is that? New Zealand? Okay, yeah, she, I want to watch what she does over the next few years. She is talented. Hey, Stan, you up top? <laughs> How are we doing? How are you doing? Uh, hey, as we head into the finals, um, first of all, what are the athletes in terms of, you know, Ben Ferguson, Mark McMorris, what are they doing right now? Well, uh, probably panting very heavily. Um, no, the good news is, I mean, Ferg, McMorris, two good friends. Um, I think there might be some competition. I'm going to have to say that it feels like Ferg is kind of the underdog, uh, as he said in his first Rido bio. I've never actually won a contest before. So if you had to ask me, do I want to see a Ferg win? Hey, Stan, how has the vibe and the energy at the top changed since it seems the wind has died down a little bit and that sun popped out? Um, you know, I think it has uh, allowed everybody to have a little bit of a sigh of relief. Uh, it's just a lot easier to see. The snow's blowing around a lot less. Things should be shaping up pretty nice for this finals round. So up in the rider's tent, are there any side bets going on right now for who's going to take finals either way? Um, I would say the amount of money that is in side bets right now might be higher than the first place purse <laughs> if you were to add it all together. I personally 
have won some money on this so far. Just saying. <laughs> Uh, how, how much money is that so far? Uh, I've taken a hundred. Shout out Dave Sanuski if you're listening. Ten <laughs> percent rule, maybe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Thanks so much, Dan. Uh, such good stuff from up there. Yeah, it's from good. Him. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. We are now going to get ready for the men's finals, um, and. The format now, again, it's a little bit different than what we saw earlier in the quarterfinals and the semifinals because we now have that tiebreaker element back into it, and I absolutely love that. Yeah, so the rider with the highest score uh, from previous round will drop second. That is an advantage, and we are back into tiebreaker time, which really adds to the drama because it makes it a best two of three run format. And again, we are going with that overall appraisal from our, uh, our awesome judges, Connor, Chad, and Sandy, and our friend Dave, difficulty, amplitude, variety, and execution. The judges want to see that creative full run from top to bottom. You can have a mistake in there, too, but they want to see the inventiveness and uh, the pure, pure snowboarding. Yeah, the execution and the control. Uh, this is the finals, ladies and gentlemen, here at Natural Selection. And look at those two names. Ben Ferguson matching up against Mark McMorris. And this is, I mean, this is a pretty equally matched in terms of the, the these two riders' approach. It's pretty equally matched. They both have an incredible contest uh, portfolio and they've also established themselves as two of the best backcountry riders on earth ben is a former pipe rider mark is the current face of slope style competitive snowboarding and it's going to be fun to watch absolutely well let's hear from ben that would be insane like just even just being invited to this event like i feel special i was driving to the resort today and just being like wow i'm like here this is crazy i remember watching the like ultra natural and those back in the day and just being like wow that's a whole nother level and so even just being here is insane winning the thing would be awesome um i've never actually like won a snowboard contest in my life so i've done pretty good in some but getting on, up on the top of the podium would be really special but i'm here to have fun and shred so i'm not too stressed and you know it's interesting because common theory would 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 lead you to believe that the rider who's dropping second has the advantage. The way Ben has been riding today, he might have the advantage. Sometimes it's better just to go. You know what you want to do. Just go out and do it. Find your line on the course. So Ben Ferguson on course. First run of men's finals. Cab underflip. Into that front side 540. And he goes down. But that's what we're talking about with the creativity. It's taking off switch, it's landing switch, it's finding your line because it is deep out there. I imagine that uh, that Mark is uh, watching that and going, okay, okay, the door is open. <laughs> I mean, think of the riders that these two have already eliminated, eliminated today. You know, Mark took out Travis Rice. Uh, ben took out Sage Kotzenberg. That backside nine, that's why Ben is on one today. Yeah. He came with a different mentality. You also have to think, these guys have taken a lot of runs yep. leading up to this. Oh, I fell. You heard it, I fell. But without that fall, if I could speak directly to Ben, I'd say that's a finals winning run if you don't fall next yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, so Mark McMorris was up top watching what just happened from Ben Ferguson. Uh, he is arguably the best slope style competitor there's ever been. And now he's competing in natural selection. What a fantastic matchup. Let's hear directly from Mark. My drive stems from wanting to be the best all-around snowboarder I can be and my love for the backcountry. And um, I would never want to be narrowed down to as just a contest snowboarder. And um, I've always enjoyed being in the backcountry, and I have so much to learn still. And doing well at the Natural Selection Tour would be a huge plus for me. Um, just as I've never really competed all that much in backcountry snowboarding and I 
really love it and want to transition my career that way but to win the natural selection tour would be like a dream come true and uh yeah i guess um nothing's too far out of reach yeah and, you know you're looking at the current the most dominant slope style rider of all time if mark pulls this off and takes out ben ferguson in the finals he enters a different stratosphere of professional snowboarding, which I did not think was possible before this event existed. Well, absolutely. I mean, the last time we really saw him in the backcountry at a competition was 2013. He has gotten so much better since then. He has put a lot of time Whoa. in. Oh, wow. Double wildcat from Mark McMorris, end over end, double backy. He's in a different stratosphere right now he's on a he's on another level front side 720 catches a little bit of snow there so he did fall right there mark mcmorris did go down adding to the drama of this final similar to ben ferguson cab wow nine from wow so that was new that wow. was new which goes to show you that Mark is always thinking two or three steps ahead yeah. of his competitors. Yeah. Yeah, there's a if there is a place that I feel like would feel dangerous to be in, it is dropping before Margaret Morris. Oh, dang it. Nice back nine, dude. I love that. Yeah, that is so awesome. Checking out the Yeti recap here. This is Ben Ferguson. There's that cab five right there. That snow is deep into the front side 540. And that's where he went down. But he follows things up with a backflip into that insane pow slash. And the backside 900 on the Great Wall. Oh, that angle on the Great Wall really shows you just how big that step down and is. to land switch in and this snow is hard and it's eerily similar these two runs because both of them had falls mark struggled a little bit more even just riding down at the end of his run so you know his flow is going to be compromised check out that double wildcat from mark mcmorris but he goes down at the bottom of the landing getting caught up in some tracks but you could really tell Mark wants this because he added some new difficulty to this run. And the front side seven, he catches his nose twice. The thing about this is a Mark, uh, excuse me, a run like this for Mark is only going to make him more determined at the top. You know, these guys, they seem very casual at the bottom. They're friends, but they are fierce competitors. Well, and it also goes to show you that even the best in the world, you're used to seeing their highlights and video parts and their landed runs on slope style courses, even the best in the world take tumbles. Right, exactly. Yeah, Oh, so it is Mark yeah, McMorris with the lead after that first run, 81.6. But still, those scores are relatively high with the falls. It, it could have gone either way, in my opinion. At that point, that's just a coin flip, right? right? Both of those runs were incredible. They had their setbacks. And, you know, lest we talk about the fact that those two are riding up the chairlift in about two minutes <laughs> yes. together. Yes. Like, talk about an interesting environment to be in, right? Because they're buddies, they're homies, but this is the natural selection finals. Totally. I would not be surprised surprised or bummed if this one went into a tiebreaker heat or tiebreaker run. I think that Ben's gonna go up there with a little bit of a fun ax to grind and he's gonna really try and step that up against Mark. I actually would really like to see it as a tiebreaker just to see more runs from these guys. Oh yeah. Yeah. Such good stuff. The road to Alaska on this tour. Six finalists from the first two events are going to advance to the finals at Tordillo Mountain Lodge in Alaska. From Jackson Hole, top three men, top one woman, and from the bald face event, one man and one woman in this inaugural natural selection tour. Of course, this Jackson Hole stop brought to you by the fine folks from Yeti.
We had a benediction this morning, some church, if you will. Austin Sweeten praying to the sun gods and saying, please, son, come out. And here we are on these final runs, and we got some sunshine, boys. And the entire dynamic of this event changed, as it does any good powder day when that sun comes out. Yeah, from no depth to just a whole vision of what is possible. We just got a glimpse of that in the final runs. Stan, my man, Levier up at the top. The level was brought uh, in, that, in that run one. Your, your, your thoughts, your insights, talk to me, Goose. You know, I think uh, Nick Morris has been someone who's been kind of making it up as he's going along. I got to say, every time in the start booth, he's like, should I do this? I have to think that that double, that cab nine, kind of just coming to him as he's riding down. I know Ben Ferguson is capable of putting something down, and if both of them are able to land on their feet, truly a battle of the Titans. Yes, yeah, Dan, talking about Mark's run, that's really interesting to hear because his thought process and his approach, in my opinion, was always that he knew exactly what he was going to do. Do you think this event, the innovativeness and the format of it is maybe throwing them off a little bit it's hard to say uh i did hear as you guys i think mentioned mark has watched the for day one broadcast every day since that first one uh just studying those lines and i think you can see it's he's sort of just internalizing and taking these weird snaking runs that we're not seeing other riders do all right stan i'm gonna put you on the spot if you were the coach for both Mark and Ben, what would you tell them to do on their next runs? Well, um, you know, <laughs> I think I'd ask Mick Mo, do you want to go 10? A lot of people have been talking about it. The kid could do it. Probably the best jumper in the world. And Ben Ferguson, I'd just say, hey, man, just land. Keep that landing gear because you've got the run. You've got the flow. You've got the power. you just got to make it to the bottom. Stan Levier, I would make you my life coach if I could afford it, sir. <laughs> Thank you uh, for constantly giving us the knowledge from the top. Enjoy the view, and we, of course, look forward to, to your debut later on today. Yes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, it's nice to be back here in the booth. It's uh, been so interesting watching the dynamics at play as uh, we get ready for run two uh, of the women's final. Thoughts? Well, I, I honestly didn't think we'd be looking at these riders in the finals. Like, I'm, my mind's kind of blown with the field that we went through to get here. Uh, it's a really exciting twist to how we're ending up this competition. Yeah, I'm really curious to see where Marion goes from here because that free ride approach that she has been taking for the entire event has gotten her this far. But now, with young Zoe Sadowski Sinat putting on a, 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 a clinic in that first run from a technical freestyle ability, it'll be interesting to see where Marion, who is, I mean, she is a champion. She comes in here three time defending free ride mountain champion. She's going to have to do something different if she wants to win this final. And she's already a little bit in the back seat. So if I'm Marion right now, I'm like, hey, this could be my last chance to be crowned natural selection champion. So you got to throw it all out there. You got to try some tricks. Yep, you got to push the tie break. And that is not a good start for Marion Arity going down on the first feature. However, if we've learned anything from this new format, it is that falls don't necessarily matter as they do in traditional contests. So get back up, put your best foot forward, and try to just start accumulating points. So flowing through the course, popping off the side and going down again. Yeah, it looked like that one kind of snuck up on her. And I'm getting the sense that she's not as uh, light on her feet right now as she was hoping to be. But, but tossing out a backy. Right. She's not giving up. So Marion Erdy. Right now, if I'm Zoe Sadowski, Sanat up top, though, I'm sitting there going, all right. I could win this thing. From wild card to finals, and now looking at potentially standing on the top of the podium. It's a big, uh, big journey Zoe's been on. 
Let's see how it uh, ends up for Marion here as she comes into the corral. Shit. Can't well, say it better than that. No, you cannot. I mean, and uh, Marianne Herty knew what she needed to do. And like I said it before, like that approach was only going to get uh, her this far, especially against the likes of, of, of someone as progressive. I mean, in nine, being only 19 and watching Zoe Sadowski Sanat, for me, the first time was watching her at the U.S. Open. And it was like, this kid has feel and when you've got that kind of feel that comfort in the air both directions etc edge control and the fact that she can make that application obviously the experience that she has at home in New Zealand in the backcountry she's showing us like this is what the future looks like it's about board control right that goes hand in hand with feel and and I'm a firm believer that some people are just born with it I think anybody up here riding this course but thus far Zoe Sadowski Sanat has been the best female rider at this event, and that's why she's in the position to potentially take a victory lap here in finals. I think it's pretty easy to say that a lot of people underestimated Zoe coming into this competition. Zoe did not underestimate Zoe. I saw her getting a back protector this morning that she uh, she borrowed from Austin Sweeten, and she clutched that thing like she'd just been given gold. And you wonder what that does for, for her confidence. I mean, her confidence has to be through the roof right now. She is going huge. Massive tail grab. And there's that, the goal she came into natural selection with the Wildcat. Let's call that huge feature. Let's call this what it is. This is the natural selection championship victory run. 100%. Zoe Sadowski Sanat is reintroducing this herself to the snowboard world. She's not just a big air rider. She's not just a slope style rider. She is an all around incredible yeah. snowboarder. Backside 360. That's the cherry on top. That's the best run we've seen today. And that was her victory lap. I don't think there's any secrets here. You can hear the crowd. Save the best for last. A final full pull for Z Sadowski Sanat and Marion Hurdy right from the from the beginning. I, yeah, I just think it was a really disappointing run for Marion. I, I don't I don't envy being in her shoes right now. However, to make it to the finals, she did prove why she's in this field. But check out Zoe Sadowski Sanat, that huge wildcat. And then the backside 360, she's staking her claim in a whole new genre of snowboarding. Went down on the backside 360 in that first run, got ragdolled, and then just goes back up and says, I know what I need to do to do it again. Didn't even quote unquote need to do it. Showing that strength, landing just right there on the back end of the knuckle, wheeling out with joy as she realizes that it's just a matter of it being official from the judges. We're looking at the inaugural women's champion I mean, crazy. of <laughs> this husband. natural selection. I believe it. Yeah, I was like, no way. Shit. Numbers do not lie. Ew. A 96. Unbelievable, <laughs> Zoe. Oh, yeah. That is heavy metal. <laughs> Zoe Sadowski Sanat again, 19. 19 years old. She just rode through that course like she's been doing this for decades. Look at the people in her wake. Jamie Anderson, Hannah Beeman, Elena Height, like some of the favorites coming into this event. Yep. And look who is standing at the top of the podium. I mean, and that's our what, wild card. And that's what happens at an event that's never been done before is the wild card can come in as the underdog 
and then just dominate. It was domination from Zoe Sadowski to not start to finish. She rode so well. And like you said, she was a bit of a sleeper. Didn't have any of, of, of that pressure in being the wild card. And you, you think about like some of the names that you mentioned. Expectation is high when you're a legend, when you're uh, the most decorated uh, women's competitor, when you're someone like Hannah Beeman, who has been one of the people who paved the way for uh, this style of women's riding. Um, but Zoe sadowski Sanat saying, thank you for paving that way. I will take this torch and take the championship, and we'll check in with Zoe, who I believe is on headset. Hello, Zoe sadowski Sanat. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm so stoked to land that last one. We talked about your being a, a wild card and how that might have taken some pressure off. What was it like for you once you realized, okay, I'm coming here, and you see the field that you had to battle? What was your mindset? Um, really, I just wanted to land some tricks that I was stoked on and land a full run. And I was just so honored to, like, be able to ride with my favorite snowboarders and learn a lot from them. And, like, yeah, being here, I've definitely learned a lot about riding POW and, and landing. So, yeah, I'm just so stoked. Hey, Zoe. Congratulations, you rode incredible. I've, I'm wondering, this is the world stage, but in another genre. So compared to dropping in at the Olympics in big air. Um, yeah, this is just the craziest thing. I never expected to be competing in natural selection and yeah, to come away with the wind. Like, it definitely means so much to me being a snowboarder and yeah, like just being here, I'm, I'm like so happy, so yeah. Hey. I'm stoked. Hey, Zoe, you talked about how on inspection day you spent some time with Hannah and she was pointing out things on the course and giving you some of the, the inside scoop on, on how to put a run together. Anything that you learned from Hannah on that inspection that brought you to where you are now with that awesome run we just saw? Um, yeah, for sure. Like, Hannah was uh, definitely showing me the ropes while we were inspecting and she taught me a lot about the hits that were in uh, natural selection last year, the test event. And yeah, she just like, yeah, showed me so much. And then before I dropped in for my first run in finals, like I was asking her, like, no one's hit the jump I'm about to hit. Like, what should I do? And she was just, she was just giving me heaps of tips. So I'm really gr grateful for that. And yeah, she's like, yeah, I've looked up to her for so long. So yeah, being, hearing that from her, like, was just amazing. Well, Zoe, uh, you are a fast student. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least, uh, to be able to take uh, that, that knowledge that you were passed down and, and win here at Natural Selection. Congratulations on being the best all-around woman in snowboarding here as the inaugural champion. Enjoy the celebration. Thank you so much. No worries. Phew. So much more we are going to see from Zoe Sadowski. Sanat, you see the path uh, that it took to get here. Uh, again, Hannah, and how about Hannah Beeman? T the loss, and then continuing to be there to coach her to the championship. A rising tide raises all ships. Amen. Well, with blue skies, we head into run two of the men's final. Ben Ferguson, Mark McMorris, two of the best in the world. We'll do this when we return here at the Yeti. Natural Selection, Jackson Hole. Okay, let's go. <laughs> That's not it. All right, let's go. For all things outdoors, we've got you covered. Chat with your gearhead today. Bow shots not included. Welcome back. You are looking live at the magnificent power of Jackson Hole, Wyoming. The Tetons showing off today. Uh, we are grateful to nature at this incredible first stop of natural selection presented by Yeti. We are in anticipation of Mark McMorris and Ben Ferguson's second runs. Mark McMorris in first. Thoughts, gentlemen. For me, it's, it's Mark's toughness. Not just his competitive nature, but his toughness 
that gives pushes me him in the edge. And it's Ben's adaptability, right? These two have never competed against each other. You know, Ben, in the competitive scene, Ben's half-pipe, Marcus Slope style, they're both at the top of their game, and we're going to get to see him go head-to-head -head in the powder. I think it's pretty interesting to see how much of that freestyle background in our riders is really what's rising to the top, right? You've got Ben and Mark, Zoe, uh, the freestyle background is really showing here today and all throughout the last couple of days at the natural selection. It's full circle. It makes you understand why this course was built the way it was, and we are seeing it ridden uh, in the way that it was intended. We showed you those beautiful shots of, of Jackson Hole and, and the Teton Range. How is it that nature does its thing that allows us to play in this way? Let's learn. In the backcountry in general, there's a lot you want to be aware of. Obviously, looking at the forecast before you head out, not just the weather forecast, but the avalanche forecast. Here at Jackson Hole, we are inbounds, but we are in a section of closed terrain that we've been managing for the event. Travis's vision led us to use this terrain specifically. The fall line and the runouts of that pitch are exactly what we're looking for. Fill that in and make it. What he has in mind and what we've been doing is accentuating the natural terrain, utilizing natural lips and making transitions where there wasn't any to begin with. I mean, we couldn't ask for a better venue. A lot of the work over the summer has been filling in gaps in the course, building out landing areas. It's a science and an art. You know, there's, there's a lot of physics as far as trajectories and landing angles and making sure all those things match up. It's been really cool to see it in the summertime and then see it in the snow and have everything to fruition. It just looks beautiful right now. What we're doing here is not standard avalanche mitigation techniques. So for the course specifically, steep areas, getting in on after every storm cycle and manipulating the snowpack. We're using a special vert snowshoes in a pattern kind of like to sort of stomp out and take out any air pockets or sun crust. With time, you get this really stable, extremely soft landing that's just like landing in air. Obviously, a lot of inherent dangers in the backcountry. On the course, we've done a lot of work to mitigate all those hazards. The riders will have a transceiver. We've got a drone crew who are eyes on the whole time. We've got stage at the top ready to respond. We're feeling pretty confident in the snowpack. We're confident in our safety plan, and I think we're going to have a real solid, safe event. When you're the COO of Natural Selection and you have a degree in quantum physics, uh, between that and Travis Rice's vision, it makes you understand how this course comes to life. And our thanks uh, to the fine folks at backcountry.com to get your natural selection gear. You want to be flexing this gear in the streets and say, I was there, I was watching at the inaugural event. Make sure you do so at, at Backcountry. Here we go. Oof. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I never thought we'd even get to this point. I never thought far enough ahead to being here right now. And looking at those names on the screen is incredible. Ben Ferguson finds himself behind. Now, of course, remember, in this finals, we're not going back to the best score after the second. All Ben Ferguson has to do is win this, and it is a new game with a tiebreaker. And I know at home, you're even if you're a Mark McMorris fan, you're rooting for Ben Ferguson in this run so we can get more snowboarding. And it, the pressure doesn't get to Ben. He's stood at the top of every major snowboard contest in the world. Let's see if he can put one down. Cab 540 into the front side five. Ben is flowing right now, popping back around a regular. And what's it going to be here? Beautiful method from Ben Ferg. That trademark method. I think for the future, we should have a mandatory method in every run. I agree. That's legislation I'm behind. <laughs> Shout out to our drone pilots, the drone racers. As it looks like Ben Ferguson went down on the 720. We'll see it back in the replay. And if I'm Ben, I'm getting one or two more pow slashes in there before hitting that rider corral. The 
level of exhaustion that these riders got to have who've made it all the way to the final. Remember this morning we were talking about the possibility of just how much snowboarding would be It's insane. It's absolutely unbelievable. I mean, this is a high-performance powder day where if you make it to the finals, you're completely gassed. All right, so we saw that fall from Ben Ferguson, a great all the way through style and technicality. Mark McMorris is not interested in a tiebreaker. He wants to slam a door. Getting some energy from the homies in the shred TP. There's nothing more that Mark McMorris can win besides this event. He's won it all. He's done it all. So sights are set. And when, when his sights are set, much like, you know, Travis Rice, it can be scary. It's a scary thing. It's a great point. The most dec decorated competitor in snowboarding. And as we competitors, uh, like Sage earlier, earlier, mentioning that a win here would have been more uh, important to him than a, another gold medal in the Olympics. I mean, this event carries a lot of weight in the snowboard world. Ab underflip to start things off. Going double wildcat, and he stops it. Mark McMorris is not holding back. He is not taking a victory lap. Clean back seven. <laughs> and pretty cool. Having some... Seriously beautiful turns in between each of these hits. It looks like he knows exactly where he's going right about now. And, and this isn't just a stay on your feet run. Mark did kind of go down there a little bit on that method. It's going to be up to the judges to call this one, but super strong run. A little backflip at the bottom uh, just to, to make them forget about that fall coming out the landing. It's so hard to land in the... Is that back nine or back seven? In the Yeti recap, is this the final run of the inaugural natural selection first stop? Ben Ferguson, combo I'm, platter up the top was strong. Cab underflip to front side five, the textbook Ben Ferg method. Into the back seven, he might have been trying to go back nine. It looked like he was thinking nine, and I think he came around and saw the lip, realized he didn't have enough time. Well, you heard Mark ask him, he said, in the bottom, was that seven or 900 you're going for? Yeah, so he opens up right there and tries to put down the landing gear, but his body is still rotating. And he goes back seat on it. But Mark also had a fault, so let's inspect what went wrong here? There's that cab underflip similar to Ben's run. The double wildcat, I mean. And that's a chopped up landing. He couldn't have landed that better. In the back seven, he stomps it perfectly. And just on a method right here, it's a little squirrely in the landing. I'd say he had a much less consequential fall here. More of a wheelie bar, he kind of slid out, but Ben definitely went down a little harder. And Mark put down his tricks. There is no question about that. Oh, judges taking their time. And it is official. You see the depth the of heck, the mutual crazy. admiration. But Mark McMorris, what else can this man do in professional snowboarding? As of now, this is it, but there will be more. It's just the first time you've seen Mark in this venue, and he walks away with the win. And look at the road that he took to get here. Coming into today with the most highly contested matchup yeah. with Travis, Travis right off the bat. Like, like we said at the top, he watched day one 
every single Damn. night. He watched the day one performances every night to get in mindset. And that's that, that's that thing that he has as, as with that extra competitor gear. Like, how many people are going to do that? Well, and think about what it does for Mark's confidence to come in to today in the first, uh, the first few runs and knock out Travis Rice. For someone that, that builds their momentum based off confidence, it's almost over right there, right? It gives him such an advantage. Well, we'll find out from the man right now. He's been in a happy mood the last uh, four days, cruising around the mountain. And there he is, Signature Purple. Congratulations, first off, uh, Mark. What, what, what was your mindset knowing that you had to start your day off against the GOAT? Thank you, Salema. Um, that was uh, not a lot of sleep. Just focusing on what, uh, what are my advantages against him, and there wasn't a lot stacking up, but I was able to ride the way I wanted to, and then um, he rode good too, so I'm glad it was a good fight. And matchup I never thought I would say I was in or win. So it's a, it was a nerve-wracking morning, to say the least. Mark, you and Ben obviously are super close friends, but you're also both very fierce competitors. What was that chairlift ride back to the top like after that first run between you and Ben? Uh, really, all we talked about is how lucky we are to be in the final and that neither of us thought we would maybe even make it past the first round you know there's just such a stacked field and anyone can rise to the occasion but it was just such a treat to be there together and as really good friends and then go head to head um, and everyone to stay safe as we did it's just a true true treat mark as you made it through the rounds today one by one did the stress grow or was it alleviated a little bit knowing that you had made it one step further um the stress peaked when I had to drop after Travis and it actually um, it disin disintegrated after and it just became really fun. I was a little bit worried for Mikkel but um, more or less when he hit the rock and then he greased his run and I figured there was no way I was going to be able to beat that but I ended up riding doing my best run at that point and yeah just started to build and have more and more fun and feel less and less scared of uh, getting lost in the trees. <laughs> Mark, uh, X Games, Olympics, you know, so many events, uh, you know, trademark event, uh, events in snowboarding uh, that you've won. What does it mean to be able to take all that, bring it here to natural selection, and get this win? What does this win mean? This win is the biggest in years that I've had, maybe my biggest to date. When all your peers care about an event, you know it's a, the, the biggest one. And you saw how, how viral that qualification day went. And people love to watch this snowboarding. And this is the true uh, essence of snowboarding, free riding with freestyle components. And um, wish Jake was here to watch us go nuts on this course. But thank you to Travis and Red Bull and Yeti and the whole gang behind this whole event for making a true, true snowboard event. Uh, thank you. Congratulations to you, Mark. You are a fine ambassador of the Sideways Stance. And enjoy this win, sir. Thank you, guys. Let's have some fun tonight. Congrats, Mark. Nice work. Cheers. Thank you. When I think about snowboarding and I think about the youth of snowboarding, I, I, it makes me think about how much snowboarding has always had to be on its feet. It's always had to pivot and innovate. Um, to move forward many times with like limited space that ski resorts would give us to play and now to see taking all that and bringing it back to the essence of the mountain what do you guys think this means for the future of where we go from here with snowboarding well ultimately stagnancy becomes suffocating in in any industry in any genre in any sport and this just unlocks a different level right snowboarding competitive snowboarding was going this way and now as of today, it's going this way. It's going in a different direction. It's providing more opportunity. It's, it's bringing more people into our culture and allowing them to see all aspects of snowboarding. And I, I think, you know, Thursday and today were very monumental days. I totally agree. Natural selection, as Mark said, it's the essence of snowboarding, right? This is, as snowboarders, what just happened here these last few days, this is what we all know and love about snowboarding. This is how we feel snowboarding. We like to watch the Olympics. We like to watch all these other events and, and are impressed by huge tricks and mind-boggling uh, feats of, of athleticism. But this is like the core of snowboarding. And so 
like it warms me from the inside to now be able to to know that what we experience as a culture can now be experienced in a really uh, engaging way by people who are not necessarily directly involved with snowboarding, but they get to see what it is about our lifestyle, our culture, our community that's so strong. Indeed, and I think that now getting to see the highest level of, of, of the sport uh, in the natural essence of the mountains, it's going to make people that much more curious about what it's like to experience that. Many times people come and have their experiences in the mountains and they stick to the groomers, which is fun. But now they get to look over into the trees and be like, I want to learn more about the mountains. I want to learn more about what makes this, this place breathe that I get to play in. And one of those factors that we have to, to study and appreciate is the joy of the geology. What formed us? How did we get here? Over 4.5 billion years of geological history have all led to this moment. It's imperative that we seek to understand this process. Located on the western slope of the Rockies, the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem is an energetically charged location, rife with geothermal and tectonic activity. Just 40 miles south of the Yellowstone caldera, the Teton Range is one of the youngest in the Rocky Mountain chain and grows at an average of one centimeter per decade. The source of this uplift is the Teton Fault, which runs the length of the Teton Range and crosses directly through the base of the Jackson Hole Mountain Resort. While the resort itself is comprised of several different types of rock formations, a closer look at the top of the mountain reveals the most iconic band of sedimentary rock, where one will find the biggest cliffs and boulders. The edge of this band runs directly through the top of the natural selection course and contributes to the unique characteristics of the venue. When the combining effects of mountain formation and erosion are met with an abundance of snowfall, these boulders complete a 500 million year journey and transform into pillows and cliff drops. Two of the defining characteristics of backcountry freestyle snowboarding. Knowing what form the areas we inhabit helps us to connect with the greater world and appreciate the forces of nature that have made the activities we love so much possible. Welcome back and thank you for spending your day with us here live from Jackson Hole, Wyoming, at stop one of this incredible history-making Yeti natural selection. We're still basking in the glory of history made in the last two days, and so we will do so with a little natural reflections brought to you by Thule. I am Salema Masakella. To my right, X Games gold medalist, Tina Dixon, T-Bird, Tom Monterosso, Sage Wisdom former editor of Snowboarder Magazine. I mean, we're all snowboarders here. We've, I, we've probably got 100 years b between the three of us, which is kind of whoa, whoa, whoa. sad to say. <laughs> um, but what what does today mean to you, Tina? I, I mean, snowboarding in a, is in a really good place, and especially women snowboarding after seeing Zoe do that run. Um, it just reminds me of those days on the mountain that I think so many of us can relate to where you're searching for powder and then maybe you see a drop and you start to work on your tricks. And I just watching her run <laughs> brought me so much joy and just made me so proud um, of where the sport is right now. And, and it's in really good hands. Yeah. And, and so much focus has been on the two days that we've run this event. But this week... For everybody that was a part of this, the down days, getting four feet of snow at Jackson, rolling in 30-person 30, 30 crews, getting, you know, thigh to waist deep powder. It was such a special week. And, and it's so important 
for snowboarding. I'm just I'm overjoyed with how this week went. Yeah, I think when I look at the beginning of this uh, of this year and what we've been through in the last year, didn't think that we'd have an opportunity to really celebrate snowboarding and what the, we've all been dealing with with the challenges of COVID and that we've been able to, to pull this event off. Uh, this makes it a very special time for snowboarding. And uh, how about we just take a look at some of these incredible runs? We'll start. Uh, we'll start off with the Jackson Hole run of the day. Tina, take it away. You see. Zoe Sadowski Sanat. Well, she came in as the wild card, but you would not even think that because she started off with that giant telegraph into the wildcat and she hit her transitions perfectly. And between runs, she was making those turns that a snowboarder dreams of and she set herself up for the rest of the run, just having fun with it while combining her skills. And for Zoe, it was just all about the freestyle approach. There were so many different types of snowboarders that were in this contest. And for Zoe, it just paid off to stay true to what she does and do incredible things in the air. I was so blown away by the fact that, you know, she went down hard the first time she did this back three and she came back and said, I got something for you. And she held the grab, landed it wheelies oh. out, but hey, that's what happens in the backcountry. And she came into this event with multiple boxes to check. I think she checked them all. When we take a look at the road uh, that she took to get here again, as Tina pointed out, wild card, and then come in straight up against the best in the world. Well, she went up against Robin Van Jen. You have to remember that, who is you know, arguably, she's the purest. She's yep. the film star in the backcountry. You know, and Zoe, yeah. beat her. Well, in, with, in talking with all the, the ladies this week, every single one of them said we never overlooked Zoe, even though she was the wild card, which by theory, or in theory, would make her the underdog. All the girls were like, no way. She's not the underdog. Yeah. Women, they saw the talent. Yeah, indeed. And women's competitive snowboarding uh, at this level and what it means for the future, I think, of, of interest and other pros taking this road. Um, it's opportunity. Yeah. Like this event gave women the opportunity to showcase their skill set, not just in a slope style course or a half pipe, but on a mountain where that's where we snowboard. I mean, this was so representative of snowboarding and um, it gave an opportunity for these women to really showcase um, their skill set. It's great. I'd love to see more of these events like this. Looking forward to it. Well, we will take it and switch it over to the men. When we woke up this morning and, and really looked at the brackets, it's like, who's it gonna be? Mark McMorris said, I will step up to the plate and make it me. I mean, yeah, if you have Zoe, who was the theoretical underdog on the men's side, the exact opposite can be said about this guy right here. Mark McMorris, the most dominant competitor of all time. Wildcat into a backside 720. And Mark was just consistent. That was the key to Mark's success, was absolute domination from start to finish. I think he only fell maybe three times in this entire event in the in the two days we've run it. And it wasn't just about, you know, what Mark did on the jumps. It was about what he did in between the jumps. His line, his approach, his flow was off the charts and he got rewarded for it. He's the champion. Dude, double dusty, what? What happened? Come on, dude, whatever. I'm that right there, he beat Travis Rice in his first heat of the day. And he said, he said, I lost sleep. I knew that that was the thing I was going to have to do first before I could even begin to think about big picture just to get past Travis Rice. And you see that road going up against Mickle Bang. Mickle gave him the heat, man. And lest we forget Ben Ferguson, he unlocked a new level in his mind, in his competitive mindset today, I, I don't think, I think I could speak for all of us, can't be more proud of Ben. He put up a serious fight against Mark McMorris. Well, we know that this is a three-stop tour. Uh, this is the road to Alaska. And next up, uh, this event will take place in Baldface, uh, in Canada. Now, obviously, because of COVID and our, our, the the, the border challenges, uh, it's going to be unique and to be adapted. 
but we promise you it will be a great event. Travis is excited about it. It will be in the spirit of what natural selection is. The second stop presented by Ford Bronco. So make sure you go to naturalselection.com to learn more details about that stop and the road to Alaska here at Natural Selection. Yeah. It's going to be incredible. I mean, this is a tour. This is a three-stop tour. It's not a one-off event. And like you mentioned, there are hurdles. There are uh, obstacles that we're facing with what we're going through. But you can't have a tour without going to interior BC and then ending in Alaska. I mean, it's the final frontier. It's the last frontier for for backcountry snowboarding. Yeah, and you know, Salema, you mentioned this earlier. It's just been a tough year, right, to have an event or hold contests and everything, and to be able to hold this event in Jackson Hole and, and do it the way that we did it and to have the success that there was. Um, and it, again, it's a tour. This isn't just a one-stop. So this was a fantastic start for the rest of the tour. Yeah. Um, all day long today, I've been seeing, over the course of the, of the entire event, I've never seen people so prepped that dialed for how they were watching uh, an event. Uh, we've been seeing the way you've been hitting us up at Natural Selection, at Red Bull Snow, uh, at Red Bull USA. Be sure to follow uh, all three moving forward at, as we get on with this road to Alaska. And for those of you who didn't get work done today, um, we apologize to your bosses for you. <laughs> you know, I love going through my Instagram feed and, you know, I follow all those like at Red Bull Snow, at Red Bull USA, at Natural Selection. And then just seeing like the matchups pop up on my phone and, and the events pop up and just all these new things or snowboarding photos or snowboarding videos. It's just so, you know, you could be wherever and thumb through and like, oh, ah, uh, yeah. this brings me joy. Indeed. Um, these next two stops uh, in Canada and Alaska will be available as show packages that are going to be put together uh, brilliantly by our Red Bull Media House team. Uh, we look forward to being live with you again uh, at the start of, of next season, but make sure uh, that, you, that you watch because these next two events are going to be incredible. <laughs> Red Bull TV, of course, available. Uh, video on demand. Get the app uh, of Red Bull TV. Um, and, yeah, I'm just like, um, I am as happy as can be. Thank you for our incredible set, uh, the fine folks at Iconica. Um, people have been asking us whose house, whose houses were robbed locally uh, so that it, we could look so, uh, so comfortable. Uh, we are super grateful to Snake River Interiors. Um, it has been a pleasure to work with you all. You all are the best in the business. Make my job very, very easy. Tina, absolutely crushing it today, doing the heavy lifting. T-Bird, you are a joy, sir. Let's, make, let's all make some turns. Let's go. Shall oh. we? Uh, you at I'm home, done. if you haven't gone snowboarding yet this year and you have the opportunity to, go snowboarding. Thank you, snowboarding. Thank you, everybody behind the scenes for bringing this thing uh, to life. And we will take you out with the ProBulin highlights from this inaugural historical first stop of Natural Selection brought to you by Yeti. Take care, everybody.
Thank you, JVP.